Hello, everybody. It appears to be 7 p.m. Good evening, Mrs. Mangan and panelists. Good evening. Do we want to give it a minute? We're pretty confident we're going to get up to 500. Do we want to? Uh... Absolutely. Okay. Just wanted to let people know if they were already logged in that we're here and that we'll be starting soon. Mr. Seligman, you will be ready with a pledge when Mrs. Mangan cues us. Alana and Chelsea, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I saw evidence of your really hard work already. Even though it seems like a long time if you're watching at home, it's only 7.02, ladies and gentlemen. So silence has a way of making time go slower. All right, why don't we give it one more minute and then we'll get started. We're being recorded and we're already on live streamed if I'm correct, understand correctly. That is correct. Okay. All right, Dr. Wall, shall I introduce? I, I would appreciate it very much. Okay, thank super. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, welcome to the second of our uh, parent meetings to share with our parent community uh, all the work that has gone into creating the reopening model that we are looking forward to welcoming students to. Um, our first meeting was last evening, focused on Harrison High School. Tonight we're focused on uh, the Lewis M. Klein Middle School and uh, tomorrow we will be focusing on the elementary schools. Uh, before we start, I'd like to ask everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Education and uh, the entire Harrison Central School District administration, um, I'd like to thank all of the parents and community members who have reached out um, as we have been going through the process of figuring out how we are going to best open schools. Um, I think everyone would agree that the very best way to open schools is with classrooms filled with children uh, led by teachers who are expert in their field, who uh, engage with them, uh, do everything that they have learned through professional development and their training to become expert teachers, differentiated instruction, getting to know the children in front of them, creating relationships with their students and among their students. 
Um, unfortunately, that is not the environment that we find ourselves in, uh, not because of any challenges in the world of education, but unfortunately because of a public health challenge, um, which at this point uh, makes returning to school in the fashion that we all know and believe would be best for students, not simply not possible. Um, I and uh, the other board members who are joining me here tonight, uh, both in their capacity as board trustees and as parents in this uh, school district, have heard various iterations as the administration and faculty and staff have tried to work through how best to educate our students in this environment while always and first and foremost uh, taking care and protecting the safe and safety and health of everyone in our district. Um, what I am confident that what parents are going to see tonight is a reflection of the immense care um, that has gone into this, um, as well as a reflection of the work that has been done over the past 20 years uh, to create teachers uh, and administrators who are simply experts and terrific in their fields. Um, I was incredibly impressed watching last evening's presentation, um, which I personally am engaged with since I will have three students in the high school. Um, but I am looking forward to um, seeing how we will be share how we will be educating children in the middle school. Um, with that, Dr. Wool, I will pass it on to you. Actually, before I do that, I just want to let um, community members know um, we're up to I think 335. We did have a full house. Um, if you hear from friends or neighbors who are having trouble accessing, once we hit 500. Um, uh, participants, that is people logged in to view this, um, they will be directed and there is a link to um, a live stream of this um, on the district webpage. In addition, um, this is being recorded. The, all of the information is going to be on the district web website tomorrow. Um, so there will be plenty of ways for people to access this information. Um, and I think my last, uh, the last thing I would share based on our experience last night um, is that many, many um, questions um, that uh, participants put, parents put in early in the evening were answered um, as the evening went through. Um, we will be answering questions uh, or the, 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 all of our speakers will be asking, answering questions such as what does a day look like? What happens on the bus? Masks, um, health and safety. So I would encourage you to, um, uh, listen to the presentation. Obviously, if something pops into your head and you want to ask a question, but please know that that most of the questions we think people will come up with um, will be addressed um, in this. Um, in addition, we have a fully formed and uh, up on our website uh, learning from home web page, um, which has school specific information um, on health and safety, on the instructional models. Um, it has a lengthy FAQ, which we are adding to on an almost daily basis based upon questions that we are getting from parents in the community. So um, I encourage you to sit back and um, listen to our teachers and administrators share with you the work that has been done over the past few weeks. Dr. Wool. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that comprehensive introduction. Um, and it, it just to uh, say again, we apologized last night if some of you weren't able to join the actual webinar, but tonight there is a live stream, so you may join. And I think, Brian, look at me when I'm asking this question. They can join either right now, the live stream, or uh, participate directly. So make it easy on yourself. Um, uh, also, as Mrs. Mangan pointed out, and one parent uh, jokingly said to me in email, I was so pleased to be able to watch it on YouTube today because I could fast forward. No, I, didn't, I did not take that personally though. Um, so um, here's what we're going to promise you that tonight is a lengthy presentation. The slide decks that were uh, presented last night will be presented tonight and tomorrow on the elementary school will be put up also on our reopening webpage, which I will show you shortly. Um, I, I want to thank the team of administrators and teachers who are here tonight, giving up another night in their own lives to make sure that we're ready for your children. This has been an ongoing effort on the part of all of them. 
Uh, you don't get to this level of detail and work without an incredible commitment from lots of people. So if you just bear with me for one minute, I'm going to share my screen with you. And that will, I hope, help you to see what I want you to see. There we go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of Zoom, where everything always works perfectly. Um, I hope that you can see that. Are you all able to see that? Panelists, just nod your head. Yes, thank you very much. Is there anything blocking your view? Okay, great. So this is our second uh, presentation in two nights. Last night we focused on the high school. Tonight we'll be recovering, re-examining some of the ground we covered. And so if you were here last night, you may hear some things repeated. First and foremost, I think it's always important to remind you that some of the decision making that we are engaged in is not of our making. That as Mrs. Mangan so aptly discussed and pointed out, this is a, a health crisis. It's not a crisis that the schools um, truly control. So who do we report to? Who, who gives us the guidance that we really are required to follow? The first, obviously, is the New York State Department of Health. Um, they issued guidance on July 13th, indicating that there were certain parameters that we had to adhere to. Many of you are aware of those, social distancing being the primary. Uh, the New York State Department of Education, who I answer to directly uh, and have to follow all of the regulations that mandate how much time children have to engage in learning in order to get credits and assessments and all of those things. They have their own set of guidelines. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control, which establish, uh, in theory anyway, uh, national guidelines for what determines whether or not it's safe for kids to be in school. And then there is our governor, who has made it um, his business, and quite successfully, I might, I might add, to reduce the rate of infection across New York State by taking very specific, aggressive approaches to ensuring the uh, community spread was stopped and in fact slowed. As you know, if we all live here, we were the epicenter and now our infection rate is below 1%. So the first mandate that I received, both from the Department of Health and the governor, said to me way back in uh, mid-August, which seems like a lifetime ago, that our primary responsibility was to educate as many students as possible in person. So that is not an option. Some people think I, I'm deciding uh, locally what, it, it, what is required of me. That's not at all the case. Based on the infection rate, we are supposed to open school and educate as many children in person as possible with that additional layer of requirement from the other two entities, um, public health and CDC. So here are the priorities that have driven us all decisions about reopening school obviously and most importantly have to ensure to the extent we can the health and safety of students faculty and staff now when i say to the greatest extent possible that means within our ability to accomplish these things in a way that are reasonable doable and also within the guidelines the second part and, and this sort of outlines how the presentation will unfold tonight and it's a part that I don't think people spend enough time talking about, the safety is important, but what happens when kids come to school? How have we prepared to ensure that there is some continuity of learning? Because my guess was way back in April, and we'll talk more about that later, was that schools are likely to open and close multiple times over the course of a school year in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, we will close uh, full time. So. The question I posed to the team way back when was, let's assume that kids are going to be fluctuating between in-person and virtual, and how do we make sure that when those changes happen, we don't disrupt their lives and the lives of families? So you will learn as the presentation goes on tonight that the hybrid model, which is what we're going to be opening under, uh, will be mirrored if we go virtual. So students' schedules will not change. Their Commitments will not change. Their assignments to classes will not change. So you'll hear more about that as we move through it. These were the models we were required to develop under the, the law, the guidance we were given. 100% in-person instruction. 
That's an easy one. That's called school. Everybody comes back to school. We know how to do that. That's what we all hope and pray for. As Mrs. Mangan said, our ideal world for everybody would be to see our children back at school living a normal life. The hybrid model, which is some students attend school, they must meet the mandates at a minimum of social distancing. You'll learn that our district has two standards in place, masking and social distancing. That was a request that we thought was not only reasonable, but made sense that came from our teachers association, because unlike kids, uh, uh, the, uh, the teaching staff will be exposed to everybody as they come through school. And the 100% remote model is the other model we were required to create, which determined how would you educate students if ultimately the governor or the Department of Health or somebody decided we had to go fully virtual. Here's where we deviated from the guidance and um, I'll tell you why. Uh, Mrs. Mangan and I had a long discussion about this and then we shared our thinking with the board. Governor Cuomo announced on August 7th uh, proudly and appropriately that the infection rate had in fact fallen below 5%, which was his barometer for schools reopening safely. But he went a step further, also a point of pride. Not only was it below 5%, it was below 1%. And so his mandate to us on the 7th was that schools are safe based on public health data to reopen. And as he had said throughout his leadership in this time, we're following the science. On that same day, he said something that uh, surprised me and troubled me. Um, he said, however, it really is a parental decision um, as to whether or not kids should feel safe going back to school. So as a superintendent, you've established a set of guidelines, but I'm a father too. And if I were sitting at home trying to make a decision, I would be concerned that I was getting conflicting information. And by the way, we get conflicting information every day. Some of you watching at home, uh, I've consulted with some medical experts who think masks are not necessary if you social distance. I've consulted others that masks are essential irrespective of social distancing. We've read in the recent research that young children do not spread. We've read that young children do spread. We've read that young children don't contract COVID. We've read recently there's an uptick in the number of kids who have COVID. So with all of the ambiguous statements in the environment, we felt that it was critically important to put that decision back in the hands of parents. And so we've decided that we are adding a fully virtual option uh, because frankly, we want you to be the arbiter of what you believe in, in, um, in the world out at large uh, is safe or not. So very quickly, I mentioned the required instructional models, face-to-face -face learning, hybrid is where we are, and online, we met those three. Um, and that's, we will begin in the middle of that Venn diagram in the hybrid model. We've now added a hybrid plus a remote option. That is what many of you want to uh, have asked questions about. We're gonna be going through that extensively. So if you're sitting at home and you have questions, I promise you 99% of them will be answered. If not, just post a question to us. Um, I've had to really engage my entire team and I, I can't commend them enough. Their dedication to the well-being and safety of your families is uh, critical to us and they, they have behaved that way. So I'm shortly going to turn this part of the presentation over to my assistant superintendent for human resources, who has taken the lead on health and safety and managing all of the protocols. But let me give you some of the big ideas. So the social distancing is well known to many of us, but for our schools, we think we can operate safely about at about 50%. That will allow the six foot distancing and the wearing of masks. We've already explored every single classroom, large and small. I've personally walked to most of them with uh, principals and members of our facilities committee. The classrooms are mostly set up. The distance markers are in place. Um, there will be some nuances. I won't get into them in grave detail here because they're gonna, great detail here, they're gonna be explored later, but things like chorus, dance, PE have different parameters. We're gonna explain to you how that's going to occur, what it means for your kids. Um, also, the wearing of masks will be required in those spaces and some programs won't have a traditional uh, option to participate. For example, there will be no full band rehearsal 
band will be primarily virtual. And while the band will meet, they will not be playing. So you'll hear more about that. All the traditional things that you know about signage, um, giving kids reminders to wash their hands, bathrooms will be, uh, certain urinals have been closed off and when stalls are not appropriately distanced, they've been closed off as well. Hallways will be designated when possible as one way, but sometimes that's not possible, but the principals will talk more about that. Lockers will not be used for the, for the most part. There's some exceptions and you'll learn what they are. And every school has a unique plan for drop off and pick up because as you know, all of our physical plants are different. Tonight you'll hear from Mr. Fried and his group about how that's gonna happen. Um, we are requiring face coverings. I know this is uh, unsettling to some, but we also have to remember that our employees have families and they, we wanna keep them safe as well. We're gonna be as mindful of this as we possibly can. There will be limited exceptions. We'll talk more about lunch in a little while. Obviously medical conditions. We have some students that can't possibly wear masks because of their disability. We have some teachers who will be wearing clear masks to address some of the speech issues. Um, we're encouraging you to use uh, reusable masks if you find them to be safe. Some cloth masks are safe. However, you may prefer to pick something else based on more recent research. In the event you can't provide your child with a mask, you should let us know that. But if a child shows up at school without a mask, they will be given a mask. Uh, we already have those in hand. Mr. Salerno was way out front in getting his orders done. Um, visitors will be very limited to our school. Um, we don't encourage parents to come and we'll have a whole section tonight on what that means. But any visitor on our property, not just in our schools, will be required to wear a mask and there'll be no deviation from that rule unless it's medically based. But um, I'd like to introduce my colleague and assistant superintendent for HR, Dr. Brian Laidwig, who has really done yeoman's work. The critical part in keeping people safe is a tight line of communication and oversight. And he has been uh, magnificent in managing this part. And I'm gonna turn this part of the meeting over to him. I will jump in and out as we go on through the night, but I hope this will give you some indication of the level of thought and detail we've put into this part of the plan. Brian? Thanks, Dr. Wool. Um, the Department of Health uh, issued guidance um, a few weeks ago uh, indicating that school districts are required to take the temperature of every student and staff member. And um, we're going to be implementing a system in the district whereby um, parents will receive a, an email uh, overnight um, asking them to complete a brief survey and to take their child's temperature and to report if it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, without the use of fever reducing drugs. And um, that's going to help give us some important information that's going to clear students' uh, arrival to, stu to school in the morning. Um, what's also, I think, important to say um, about that is we've implemented a, an app, uh, some technology that's going to help us collect that information in a reliable way. Um, so when parents complete the survey, it'll link to their child's phone if their child has a phone, uh, a middle or high school student. And when the student arrives at school, they will have um, a colored badge, a QR code on their phone that they can show. And a green badge means that they've, parents have completed the survey and all the answered questions were no, which means that they're able to enter school without any, any issue. Um, and any student that hasn't completed the uh, survey, it would come up in another color gray to tell us that it needed um, some attention, in which case we'd be taking the student's temperature at school. Um, the reason we're asking and uh, parents to take the temperatures and answer the questions before students leave their home. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. First, it's recommended by the Department of Health because um, first of all, parents know their children best. They know when they're not feeling well, they know um, uh, when something doesn't seem right, um, what their indicators are for illness, and parents oftentimes um, have the very best reconnaissance in that interaction with their child. The other reason, though, that we're having parents do that before the child leaves home is that we'd rather um, have that information and know that information and the parent have that information before the child gets on a school bus, right? So if this is a child riding a bus uh, or walking to school, um, we would rather that the parent um, have answered those questions and get a notification on their phone that the child shouldn't report to school because perhaps they have a symptom or they've had contact with somebody that's COVID positive. 
Um, the other reason that we're asking parents to complete the survey at home before they send their child is that we're trying to manage the arrival of students at school in a way that manages for social distancing, that um, facilitates students' entrance into school in an efficient way, um, and that will allow us to move the students through quickly who have completed the screening. And uh, for those students who have not, um, as you can see on this screen on the right-hand side, the uncertified gray indication, um, this is what the student would have on their phone, uh, would tell us that they need to be checked with their temperature at school. We're obviously mindful that many, uh, most if not all elementary age children don't have cell phones and won't have them to show that they've, their parents have completed their survey. So the system will produce for us student specific uh, barcodes or QR codes as you see on the screen here. Uh, and each barcode will be printed on a piece of paper that a staff member will have. And as a student uh, approaches the, the, uh, the entrance to the school, we can quickly scan that QR code and immediately see that the parent had completed the survey that morning. And of course, if they haven't, um, then we would be able to take the child's temperature. We're going to be doing a lot of outreach to parents to remind them of the, not only how this protocol will work in specific um, detailed steps, but also to remind parents that we're really seeking your help to be good partners to us in this. We can't emphasize enough um, that uh, the importance of having parents um, monitor their children for symptoms, not send them to school if they're sick, um, answer the survey questions in the morning so that we have the information we need to get the school day started it is critical that we have parents partnership in that. So you'll be hearing a lot about it and you'll get some phone calls from us uh, to remind you if you happen to forget on a morning, but um, we're really looking forward to that partnership. That's, that's hey, it. Hey, Brian, uh, there's a question that popped up in the, that I think it's relevant. You don't have to have a smartphone to do this. You can do it from your computer. And also your child does not have to have a phone because the report will be generated by the principals and we'll be able to find the child. So your only responsibility here is to try and remember to, to get online and answer the questions for your child. And as I understand it, it's one point of entry if you have multiple children. Uh, that's right. And it um, will, you're right about that, Dr. Will. It's, um, it's a, simply a link that comes to parents in an email so they can complete the survey on a phone, on a tablet, on their computer, whatever is easiest and most convenient. Um, and it does not require students to have a phone when they come to school. We'll have those reports that the system generates, and we'll also have students listed by name and QR code uh, as they arrive, so we can scan those. And would you just briefly talk about the other feature of this phone, which um, we're so excited about, although we don't want to be excited, it helps us tremendously with con contact tracing. Yes, uh, so one of the other Department of Health requirements is that school districts have a plan for contact tracing. Um, and contact tracing, if that's an unfamiliar term to anyone, simply means that there's a method by which we um, share information with the Department of Health in the event of a positive case so that the Department of Health can do follow-up to determine who needs to be tested and quarantined and isolated um, as a result of that exposure. So um, school districts are required to have a plan for contact tracing so that we can share information with the Department of Health, um, and that's per their order. Uh, and so this system is integrated with our student information system. So it will tell us if a student, um, let's say, tests positive, God forbid, uh, it would generate a list of names of other students and staff members who had, um, based on the student schedule, interaction with that child. Uh, we would turn that information over to the Department of Health and we would follow whatever guidance they gave us in terms of doing any outreach or advising those families uh, to contact the Department of Health. And I'm going to just, uh, you and I are going to have a conversation. I think it'll help people to answer some of the questions that are being posed in the chat. Um, our hope is that parents will not send their children to school if they're sick. And we will be doing our very best to intercept children that are not feeling well. In this environment, for certain, it is not a good idea to send any child to school feeling under the weather. And um, I, we agree with you that temperature is not the only variable that needs to be considered, but remember again that many of these directives uh, are not within our jurisdiction. This is a mandate. We must do this in order to allow people to enter our buildings. So Brian, with your permission, I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm going to try to go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, and this is the, the area where it really gets interesting uh, and complicated the COVID-19 symptom protocol, which was part of the question the person was asking. So maybe you could take us through this. 
Sure. Uh, so we have been working really closely with our school district physician, our school nurses, and um, contacts at the New York State and Westchester Department of Health um, to develop um, a COVID health protocol or a COVID symptom protocol, which will spell out in really explicit terms um, all the steps that we will take if a student or a staff member becomes uh, symptomatic. Um, so, and we'll publish the criteria that we use to make determinations. So parents know well that um, kids sometimes um, get sick. They come down with things at school. It can be completely unrelated to COVID. It could be allergies. It could be a cold. It could be the flu. And so the nurses are working very carefully with me and the, the school district physician to make sure that we are very precise about the combination of COVID-related symptoms that would require or result in a referral for testing and then um, a direction to the parent that the student has to stay home for um, 10 days or until the symptoms are resolved for uh, seven and 72 hours of symptom resolution or uh, the ability to return to school with a negative COVID test. Um, so we're working out that protocol now. Um, the New York State Department of Health is supposed to be coming out with some clear guidance on that next week, which obviously uh, our criteria will be closely aligned to. But if a student does or a staff member becomes uh, symptomatic while at school, um, this protocol will specify the steps that we take, which includes being assessed by the school nurse uh, and additional PPE will be used by the nurse as well as um, the person that's um, experiencing symptoms. We've designated an isolation area at each school so that um, the person who has these symptoms can be assessed by the nurse, cared for, and um, held in that space until pickup is arranged. Um, and parents would be contacted um, to come pick up a child that's presenting with those symptoms. Um, any, uh, all of our isolation spaces um, are equipped with um, uh, all of the necessary um, disinfectant, disinfectants and uh, making sure that they're clean, safe spaces. They'll be cleaned and disinfected after each use as well, and that's a requirement by the state and in our protocol. Um, and any symptomatic, um, oops. I'm sorry, did you want to go back to that one? I was just uh, Yeah, I was almost done. If we could just go back one slide. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, and then any symptomatic individuals, um, we will be relying on the criteria from the CDC and the um, New York State Department of Health before they are allowed to return. So sometimes, People hear the differences between a 10-day isolation versus a 14-day quarantine. Um, our protocol will spell that out in really explicit language, and it will address um, when people have siblings, kids have siblings, and what the requirement is if a, a child has to be quarantined, what's the impact on their sibling. Uh, we'll list all that in as clear language as we very possibly can. Um, and Dr. Wool, you mentioned the need to have really clear communication. So we're identifying a COVID liaison in each building um, who will work directly with me as the COVID district coordinator. And then I have a direct line, not only to our school district physician, but to the Department of Health as well, so that we can manage all of the information sharing in as ex explicit a way as we can, as transparent a way as we can, but, and parents will I'm sure appreciate and understand with regard to the um, confidentiality and privacy rights that we're obligated to follow for students and staff. Yeah, and I, I, I said at the outset, you know, one of the things that Brian has done so well is you want a very clear, tight through line of communication so that nothing is missed. He's also worked diligently with our nurses who are just working tirelessly on, on their own to get more expert at how to do this and protect all of your kids. Um, we should probably just take a moment here to, to talk about currently who makes the decisions uh, to isolate kids. There, is, there was some confusion that the governor created in his um, press conference on the 7th, where he asked for a school district's plan for contact tracing, and we shared with you to the extent we can what we will be doing, but he also mandated that we have a testing protocol. I'll just say for your information, folks at home, we have no authority to mandate a test, to direct people to take a test. All of that falls under the direct a discretion of the Westchester County Department of Health. But Brian, there are some other things and we should make it clear um, who makes the decisions about quarantine, who makes the decisions about opening, closing and school. And I'll, I'll jump in, but why don't you take that? Sure, so any decision about isolating somebody that's sick or quarantining somebody who's suspected to have um, had contact with somebody with a positive case, uh, those determinations are explicitly the jurisdiction of the New York State Department of Health. 
Um, they have let us know that it will be their responsibility, of course, working in concert with the school district, but um, to do the outreach directly to individuals when they need to quarantine or um, isolate. And when the Department of Health gives that order, it is an order uh, and it is not negotiable. And so people, you know, we need, obviously people will, I'm sure, but to know that that's an important um, responsibility to follow. The uh, decision to close school, however, is not within the jurisdiction of the New York State or the Westchester County Department of Health. Um, that is gonna, going to be a local decision informed by guidance from the New York State Department of Health, but also in consultation with the New York State Education Department. Um, and anytime there is um, an outbreak or uh, an increase in cases, we're going to be in very close consultation with both the Department of Health and the State Ed Department. Um, to take their guidance in making a determination about whether a classroom or a school or even the whole district needs to close. That's right. And one of the things that I'm calling for is an explicit set of standards that all school districts should follow. Uh, because as much as I appreciate the local discretion, uh, this is not our area of expertise. And I can share with you, and we've had a very frank conversation with the board, lacking explicit guidance, we're going to err on the side of safety. So that could also possibly increase the number of times schools get closed. Some of and the questions- also, um, If I can just interrupt for a moment, worth noting mm -hmm. that um, the, the Board of Education is also working with our um, advocacy groups to hopefully facilitate that guidance. Um, we don't think that it's helpful. We, we've seen this um, across the country um, where di different decisions are being made in different places based on different criteria. And, and we don't think that that is in any way helpful um, if it's happening in school districts, if, you know, if, if neighboring school districts have a different set of criteria than we have, um, we don't think that that's helpful or meaningful for anyone um, or creates any confidence um, in how this system is proceeding. So we're gonna be working Dr. Will and his colleagues, superintendent colleagues, administrator colleagues, and, and, and boards of, board of education advocacy groups are gonna be pushing for that as well. But I would just say that ab absent that guidance, if yes. it doesn't come, we will err on the side of the health and safety of your children and our faculty and staff. Um, I, some folks in the chat are saying, uh, we haven't gotten to the hybrid model. What does it mean? I would say, be patient, it's coming. So just another slide here. I'm sorry, I apologize, the controller is not being as responsive as I would like. Whoops, maybe it is. There we go. Cleaning school facilities. So Mrs. Madunio, are you with us this evening? I don't think yeah. she You are, thank you. Uh, Margaret works uh, in concert with Bob uh, Salerno and she has been intricately involved in what is going to occur in the cleaning. So. I'm gonna let her take this, take us through this slide, Margaret, would you mind? Oh, not at all. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Wool. Um, so yes, as Dr. Wool mentioned, uh, the business official, Bob Salerno, has been working closely with the director of facilities to make sure every precaution that we can think of is in place by the time school opens. Um, mandatory cleaning logs will be maintained by each school's custodial staff. They'll be signed off you know, every day. Um, we're going to be using uh, specialized electrostatic disinfectant applicators, um, which basically is sort of a high power spray that will be used in every classroom at the end of each day. Um, and it, it, the important thing to note is that it, can, it will stick on all, all surfaces, uh, places that just wouldn't be humanly possible if it was up to a person to you know, go to every desk and clean. Um, it'll, it'll stick underneath the desk, and just you know, many more places that wouldn't be possible um, just by using a cleaner. Uh, we currently have 10, uh, I'm sorry, we, we plan on having 10 in total. We have six in house right now and the remaining four are on their way. Um, all the custodial staff is being trained. Actually, as of now, all training has been completed in using these, these new tools. Uh, we have uh, cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. We'll focus on all important touch points, like tables, um, armrests, doorknobs, light switches, keyboards, and uh, restrooms, et cetera. Um, cleaning will continually take place throughout every school day. Um, and all products that we're using, they have to be EPA approved, uh, school safe cleaning products that are effective on coronavirus those products will be used throughout every school. 
Uh, we also are uh, available in all classrooms right now. We will have sanitizing wipes, spray disinfecting bottles, and hand pump sanitizers. That's in addition to the sanitizing machines that will be placed strategically throughout every building. Uh, we've purchased, as Dr. Will mentioned earlier, we have 40,000 masks currently on hand, um, and we you know, keep ordering more whenever, whenever they're available. Um, and then as students enter the classrooms, we're going to have paper coverings that they're going to be able to take to their desks and they can cover their workspace. So, you know, if they still choose to use sanitizing wipes on top of that, they will at least start off with a fresh covering on their desk every day. Um, if they leave the classroom, those coverings will be, you know, discarded at the end of class. And when the next round comes in, they will start with a fresh, um, fresh covering. Thank you for sharing that, Margaret, because that's a particular, that has been a particular challenge in all districts. And you may wonder why we would have paper coverings. As Margaret pointed out, we are already going to have hand sanitizer in the rooms. We're going to have wipes. So the kids, in theory, particularly middle school and high school, are capable of wiping down their desks. Many times when our kids are in a fitness center, they do that anyway but the guidance does not permit us to direct students to clean their desks, which I don't think is necessarily in the best interest of kids. So we have a twofold model. The, the, the child will be able to cover their entire desk with a piece of uh, newsprint and dispose of it at the end of the period. But if a child chooses and you choose to allow them, they can also sanitize their own desks and teachers will have access to that as well. Um, the next one is probably the one that is getting the most attention at the moment in the press. And ventilation is a very big challenge for us um, because we're, our buildings are old. But we've done a lot of upgrades in the last several years, some of it related to the bond. Those big machines that sit in the back of every classroom and are sometimes noisy, the unit ventilators have all been repaired. Um, they've all been uh, most have had MERV filters installed all will before the opening of school. Um, there's been a change in the regulation. Classroom windows were always able to be open, but doors were not. And in this environment, we're allowed to open doors. So this just something as simple as cross ventilation will help tremendously. Uh, Margaret and or Brian, you just talk a little bit about the ceiling fans and the 100 iWave generators. Either. Um, sure. So we do plan on installing by the time school opens, ceiling fans will be installed in um, any room that has limited air circulation. Um, and we are, we are ordering 100 iWave ion generators that will be installed uh, wherever there's an air conditioning unit without a window. Um, I think, Brian, can I defer the definition to you? Because you <laughs> explained it most excellently last night. <laughs> sure, yeah, I've, I've learned more about this than I ever thought I would. Um, so these are um, systems that are added to what are called split air conditioners. So not window units, but um, those air conditioners you sometimes see mounted on walls. Um, and this basically introduces an ionization process, which um, basically robs um, any mo molecule of its um, hydrogen particle. And as a result, it has the effect of killing the bacteria that, uh, or the virus or even the mold that may be passing through that air system. So um, it doesn't produce any ozone um, and it um, is very effective at um, cleaning the breathing zones or the airspace in a particular room. So we're adding those throughout the district wherever we have those split air conditioner systems. Thank, thank you both. That was very helpful. Uh, obviously, we're going to do everything we can to make it uh, evident that things are different for students. One of the things we're going to spend a lot of time talking about is the beautiful building behind me, which should be actually prepared by the time your children arrive. Unfortunately, will not be the school that they left. Many things are going to be different. So there'll be signage to talk about hand washing and all of the appropriate things to do. Hand sanitizers will be placed throughout the building, but every classroom will have hand sanitizer in it. We have shut off the water fountains and we are putting bottle filling uh, devices in their place. We are encouraging you to send your children to school with a filled uh, bottle of water. Uh, and germ barriers have been placed at strategic locations in main offices where we, the public comes in contact with other people to sort of limit 
the, the uh, ability of aerosol to get in into those places. But I'd like to introduce at this point our, our principal, Mr. Freed. I compliment Mr. Freed a lot on one thing in particular. He is probably the best principal I've ever seen at managing the comings and goings of a school. He has a tremendous command of how to manage uh, a very large middle school. And it's one of the reasons if you've ever visited our middle school, it doesn't feel large at all. Uh, the halls are always quiet. The kids travel basically without the use of bells. So he, uh, he's going to take you through some of the more challenging aspects of operating a school in this environment. And always remember right now, folks, whenever school is functioning, it's half the population. We're in the hybrid model. So typically we would have 900 students in our school. It'll be half that number. Scott, good evening. Good evening, Dr. Wool. Um, so the first piece on here is the student entry and dismissal. So um, questions are asked about the entry into the building and about drop-off and procedures with that. One of the advantages of the drop-off procedures, can you go back a slide, look? I'm sorry, Scott. I, okay. It's just, uh, it's being a little finicky tonight. It's all right. 17. One of the, um, as I was saying, one of the advantages in the morning is that buses and cars by their nature are staggered. Parents come at varying times. Um, in addition to that, if you see the first bullet point here, there are teachers and teacher aides, school aides, um, the two assistant principals and I are outside, and we have the ability to monitor the flow of traffic for arrival and dismissal. So while we have the advantage of buses coming at varying times, we will also slow the ability for students to get out of cars if necessary to maintain the social distancing as they walk along. Students are gonna follow designated paths as they, as they always have before, and they will go to designated areas that are separated by grade level. We have outdoor areas that are away from each other. We have indoor areas. We'll make decisions on areas they can enter into and which doorways. Um, our goal obviously is to have them outside because we know that's safer and until weather changes, we will keep them outside if at all possible. We also, I think you mentioned Dr. Will that we don't have bells and it helps us. We also um, have a structure in the building without going into many details is that classes don't always move at the same time to begin with. There are many periods during the day that overlap, and so there's fewer students moving at a given time. That helps us. But in addition, working with teams of teachers, we've already had a meeting to discuss this. Um, we're gonna stagger the ability for students to move at different times. It'll help us. So if you take into account half the students and grades being not all changing at the same time, and then teachers working in harmony with each other, we'll limit the number of students uh, dramatically. And of course, at all times, students from the beginning, we're going to, in orientations with them, educate them on something which they're all familiar with by now, you know, social distancing and moving at paces. And that's gonna be a challenge, but they're used to it from the communities they live in and they'll follow that inside of school as well. Uh, questions have been asked about lunch. So we're cohorting students as we always do um, by teams. You're, most people who are been to the middle school, and for those of you who are new, students come in and they're part of one of the nine interdisciplinary teams. When you're on a team, you will have the same group of students for your home base, your English, social studies, math, and science class. Uh, following the guidance that's given to us, we're trying to cohort as much as possible. And when they get to lunch, we will organize them using that same cohort. Um, that doesn't mean they'll all be at a table because our tables will be assigned and we're looking at about three students at the table that normally would fit 12. They're all socially distanced. We've walked the cafeterias. Um, we may need more room using the large group instruction room next door and we have that set up and there'll be um, designated piece of things on each chair that we can use. I blamed Michael Greenfield last night and I was wrong. There's a little bit of a glitch in, in this uh, model. There we go, Scott. So we're talking about visitors and some of these things are coming right up. Orientations back to school night. People have questions. Some of these events are on our calendar and we're very concerned about how kids get oriented to the new school, particularly rising fifth graders. You heard Ms. Bukema talk last night about ninth grade orientation. So Scott will take you through how we're going to make sure your kids have a sense of belonging. Whoops, there we go. 
So I think you addressed the first question is that we're going to strictly limit visitors and we'd ask that people make an appointment. And in most cases, when parents have meetings, we can do them virtually. So if a parent was to come in for a team meeting um, or an individual meeting or a meeting with one of the assistant principals or a counselor at me, we'll try to do them virtually um, to whatever extent possible. So the sixth grade orientation and the new student orientation, which is the orientation for anybody who's coming here as a seventh or an eighth grader and just moved here, they will occur in person. And the sixth grade one, which is upwards of, you know, the whole grade would amount to 275, 280 students. We're gonna have them in person, but we're gonna do them in organized teams. So whether you're on L, M, or K, they'll be on the date on the calendar, which is um, a week from tomorrow. It'll be either nine o'clock, 11 o'clock, or one o'clock. And before that time happens, we will have sent out to you information about schedules and such. Um, that's an orientation, Dr. Wool, that I think you were talking about that we really think is important. We want students to feel comfortable. Um, we do recognize that our fifth graders did not have a buddy day. Um, they were in the building once for a concert, um, but we want to relieve any feelings they have about not knowing the place. And so we're going to bring them in by team, which will roughly be a maximum of about 90 students, probably fewer, because we do recognize that people can't always make it. They're on vacations. We'll run through a couple of different rotations. We'll go through what the schedule is like. We'll take them on a tour um, and we'll do it in four distinct groups. We'll go over some of the protocols. There is no concern if you cannot be there. We do recognize that might happen because people are away. We go over the information the first days of school. Uh, Mr. DeMundo, the new counselor, and I are going to plan for a type of video which will go over a few things, give them kind of an orientation in that way for those who can't be there as well. And the new student orientation is the same idea. We go over, you know, what life is like in the middle school, show them around. There obviously are some dis differences. We can't have the typical browse and wander around that we might have done in the past. And we've eliminated the brunch aspect of our sixth grade orientation. But we're really looking forward to an opportunity for our children to be in the building. And Scott, um, folks will be getting a communication directly from the middle school soon that will outline each of these things, including pretty soon you'll be getting your designation, whether you're Husky or Pride. Is that right? That is correct. Actually, the um, parents of sixth graders have received a couple of uh, pieces of information to me about saving the date. Um, what they're probably waiting for is, and, and rightfully so, is which team am I on, which should be out by the latest, the Monday before the Wednesday orientation. It'll be digital, you'll log into the portal and you'll find out what team you're on and then you'll know which orientation to go to. Thank you. And the, folks, I'm monitoring the, uh, the chat, uh, the questions as we go through it. And so that's why my screen is jumping around a little bit, but just wanna answer a question I think is a good one. We recommend that the temperature taking occur the morning, not in the evening before kids go to bed. So that's, that's a good question, thanks for asking. So we want to remind you that we are mindful of many things. Um, we are mindful that your children have not been back to school in a long time. We are sad and mindful that the school that they are coming back to is not the school that they left. The same is true for our faculty and staff. And we have spent an inordinate amount of time trying to help our faculty, and you'll hear more about that, be prepared for what we think will be, in the short term anyway, the eventuality that we'll either be in the hybrid or a fully virtual model. But how do we get teachers reacclimated to school on those days in the same way that Scott is gonna tell you in a few minutes about how we're gonna reacclimate students. So you will see that there is a symmetry here. Scott, you wanna take us through what teachers will experience in their first two days back? And I'm just gonna say out loud, we're also adding a third day, so children will be starting school later. I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's to just give teachers one full day to prepare for the coming two weeks of school. Sure. Um, when teachers return, we've already been working with our school psychologists um, to begin with on a number of things to address some of the social and emotional needs of students. So that's one part where we'll go through everything from uh, helping students and helping staff, frankly, with what they might have experienced. Um, there are numerous things that people have experienced over the last several months, and we want our staff to be able to help answer those questions, have those discussions with students. We're also going to go through with staff every single protocol that you can imagine. Um, talking to children on those first days about how to walk in the building, hand washing, um, hand sanitizing, um, going through all the experiences, stairs that go in one direction, um, how lunch is going to be, what it's like to come in in the morning, um, 
all these pieces as well as the usual stuff, which is, you know, the typical classroom environment. We do want to keep that sense of normality. Is that how you, you know, interact within the classroom, setting up your Google Classroom, being prepared for the virtual and non-virtual world. But the teachers and I um, and the AP is going to go through every last piece of information. Um, and for them, it's going to be very similar. They're going to have to learn all the protocols as well. And while they're privy to it right now, more so than maybe the students, they're going to be led by both me and our three school psychologists. And we've talked about numerous things. Um, we're going to use our advisory program for opportunities for conversations with students and small Could you groups. Just explain, Scott, what for, for those that might be unfamiliar, the advisory program is one of my favorite features of middle school. You want to talk about how that works? Yes. Um, so in the morning, when students come in the building, uh, they begin their day with about 20 minutes that's used sometimes for a quiet reading period because you want to emphasize the importance of reading and other times during the week for an advisory session. And what happens is the home base, which typically would have, let's say, roughly you know, 22, 24 students, is split in half because there were two teachers there for the home base. And there's two parts to it, actually. One is a, a teacher with a group of about 10 to 12 students getting to know them in a, in a really close relationship. It's the person they see every morning. It's the one they can talk to about any number of things in an open dialogue, um, a friendly face, a connection that's really one of the most important things in middle school. At the same time, there's also specific lessons that we have with students that go through everything from internet safety to understanding the biases that might exist in the world. Um, some of the things that are going on in the world, um, social justice will be discussed there. Conversations with students, understanding and celebrating the differences that we have in our population. Um, all those are part of our advisory program. So it serves like multiple purposes. Great, thank you. And if I'll just finish up that slide, I wanna just say that, you know, we understand that our teachers are stepping into this new world and we wanna give them plenty of time to get their classrooms organized, to check out their technology, to make sure there'll be no glitches, uh, to just to get to know the environment. And my assistant superintendent, who you'll hear from shortly for, uh, for curriculum and instruction, after careful consultation with teachers and principals, we've decided we need one additional day because there are so many things to go over with teachers. We don't want them overwhelmed when they start school, just like we don't want your children overwhelmed. So we're gonna spend one full day focused exclusively on instructional planning. So that's yeah. what the additional day will, will be, be about. And you know, faculty and kids have gone through an awful lot. And we wanna make sure that faculty know that there are people on staff that they can reach out to if they're struggling. And now, as importantly, we want to talk about your students. So, Scott? Okay, so the beginnings of school always are a series of orientations in the middle school. Um, we take that home base, which is used for advisory and reading, and we always, as I mentioned earlier, and we extend it um, upwards of an hour those first couple of days of school. We'll use that time longer, more days, especially since, as you'll learn later, some students are coming on one day, some on the other. And in addition to many of the things that we go over, which are, like I said earlier, the things that are typical in the school, general behaviors, general understanding of how to you know, use the, you know, the cafeteria, we're gonna go through all the new safety protocols, which is, again, everything from social distancing, the importance of maintaining that mask. Um, when you go to the bathroom, you know, washing your hands, noting the fact that if someone's in the bathroom, you may have to step out and walk and wait because we're gonna put help students understand that there might be multiple people and we wanna limit the numbers there. Recognizing what you do when a bathroom is closed down because periodically they will be because of the intensive cleaning. Um, we're gonna go through all those pieces at the same time, there's the other half, which is the instructional piece, going over with students. You know, what is it like? Because you know, learning how to you know, function in the system where you're in school one day and home the other is gonna take some, some time to get used to and it's the challenge of going through that. So um, you can see the second bullet. Students are also throughout these orientations, always learn every single person that's their support in the building. Who are the school psychologists? They know their counselor, but who are the other counselors? What's the role of the two assistant principals? What's my role? Because sometimes students don't see that the principal is so much more than the person who runs the school, but I'm the guy they can come and talk to also if they have a question. Um, and teachers are going to work with students to remind them in that home base and others that like, if there's a question, if there's something going on, they're gonna look for the signs, but students at the same time are gonna know that they're comfortable reaching out. And one of the things that we take pride in the middle school is that students come to teachers. They say like, this is what's going on. It might not just be with them. 
but we count on them to really be the support for their peers, which is very much the case a lot of times for us, where they help us understand that something's going on with one of my friends, I don't want you to know it's me, but can you look into it? And it helps us because we really have that kind of collaborative staff and student body. We really do. We have just an outstanding psychological staff at the middle school, one of the best I've ever seen. I also want to say, although it's not COVID related, it helps tremendously in this environment. Students, if you're new, if parents, if you're new to the middle school, your child stays with the same guidance counselor for three years. So they develop deep relationships with their kids. And I promise you that's going to be an asset. Before we go to the next slide, I just want to answer some questions that are out there. Um, the kids will be chosen for, see, how will they sit at their table, Scott, initially um, for the three kids that are going to be cohorted? In the cafeteria? Yeah. So we're gonna organize the students probably using the home, their home base. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be our lead. Now a home base is gonna have obviously, you know, 12 students on a given day, and then we'll start assigning them to the cabinet. Part of our orientation process is going to include first time in the lunchroom, um, which might typically be an orientation for sixth graders. This time it'll be for all three grades. This is your seat. Um, and this is where, you know, how it's going to be in the cafeteria because we're gonna be calling tables up to get food. It's, it's a new experience for everybody. And we, we are not re taking requests for switching of teams or planning teams. And let, let me explain why. That's not to say it couldn't happen if there were an extreme circumstance. You should always reach out to your guidance counselor. But what we do with the four incoming fifth grades is we try to balance each team to blend them, gender, uh, ability level, uh, ENL students, special education, uh, um, elementary school designation so you wouldn't find one school that was all one elementary school because part of our work is to build community in the middle school. But no one should think that that means we are oblivious that sometimes things don't work. Uh, it's not an easy thing to pull off, but if there's a legitimate qua case, we, we will work at that. And I see specific questions. Some of these are better answered directly to your counselor or your principal. So if you have a question about your child, our, our ears and hearts and minds are open. We, the system is built to try to accommodate kids, not to make their lives difficult. So we'll do everything we can to make it uh, feel comfortable for kids, particularly the incoming sixth grade. Um, if I may, and just get to the next slide. Not behaving tonight. I apologize, folks, but it's not me. So here's the question that, whoops, here's the question you just asked. What is the change of date? So the first day of school for students is moved back. It'll be September 9th. They will not lose a day of instruction. Uh, they will make up that day on February 5th, which was currently a superintendent's conference day. It will now become a full day of school. In addition to that, this is what I want to spend time with because oftentimes people uh, say to us, what are you doing? What have you done? And sometimes we are able to communicate it all, but I think this slide is helpful. Back in April, I met with the team. I was reminding the board, it says May, June, but it was actually in April the first time I, I mentioned this. Um, I was concerned that our teachers were thrust into something that they did their very best at, but they hadn't been fully prepared for. What does it mean to teach effectively in the virtual setting? And at that point, we were unaware as to whether or not summer school would be virtual or not. We were hoping that it might be in person. Ultimately, it ended up not being in person. But the question I posed to the team and to the board at that point is, our best guess is that we're going to end up in a hybrid model, but likely a fully virtual model. We have over 340 teachers. How do we get everybody ready for that eventuality? So the first thing we did was we looked at some of the successes and some of the struggles we had, and we did some really tight research back in May and June, and we immediately began to redesign our professional development program. But as importantly, we quadrupled the number of kids who were going to participate in our summer learning for students. We also redesigned those as well because we wanted to do two things there. We wanted to address the learning gap, but we wanted to use those 700 students who ultimately attended those programs 
as a way for our teachers to assess the effectiveness of the redesign that they were going through. They were redesigning curriculum. They were taking training uh, in professional learning, 75 courses in how to be more effective in the virtual domain. But Michael was also mindful that it re would require a great deal of curriculum rewrite. So presently, we've completed over a thousand hours of redesign of our curriculum and rewrite, and we're going to be engaging in another 500 hours before school reopens. I was meeting with the elementary team the other day. They have 500 lessons that they've already written that have been redesigned. They were also very strategic in training teachers in every building to be supportive of colleagues who may have not taken as many courses. So we basically have turnkey trainers in all of our schools. And uh, we then implemented all of these theories and practices with our 700 students. We got great feedback from the kids. We think we were um, successful, but now we're going to put this to the ultimate test. Now that we have a plan, we've done our research, we're going to implement and we're going to assess and adjust. So at the end of two weeks, everybody will be surveyed. That'll be more of a building-based survey. How's it going for you in the building? At the end of four weeks, we're going to do more of a programmatic survey, which will go out to all parents. And then at the end of 10 weeks, which is the end of a marking period at the secondary level, we work at trimesters at the uh, elementary level, but that survey will come out at 10 weeks and we'll have a better sense of how is it really going. And you'll hear more about that. But I, I credit uh, my assistant superintendent, who I'm about to introduce to you, with managing all of this. And you will meet many of the members of the team. Uh, I'm most proud of the incredible commitment our teachers made. As you can see, 70% of the faculty participated in this work during the summer months to build their own ability to not only teach more effectively, but to determine what works. So Michael, um, without further ado, if I can get these slides to be a little more cooperative, you are up. So thank you, Dr. Wool. Um, I, I think you uh, highlighted the most important uh, aspects of our planning model. We went from an emergency remote learning uh, uh, set of circumstances and uh, use that experience and the research that's out there and our internal um, expertise to design a model that would um, be that would prepare us for this eventuality which is the hybrid uh, model and the summer support for students became uh, a, a really powerful laboratory for our teachers and our leaders to determine what works um, so the, uh, um, the outcome was that more than 700 students participated, K through 12. Um, particularly, we added programs that we had not had before in our middle school. Uh, we added a math extension program to support students who may have a learning gap or may um, just need to continue uh, extension of support during the summer to be prepared for the opening from fifth to sixth grade, from sixth to seventh, seventh to eighth, and so on. We had a humanities program that um, actually was a forward thinking approach to extension, a partnership between the English language arts and the social studies department. And that mirrored in many ways, the experience that students have uh, begun to uh, have through the uh, International Baccalaureate Middle Years uh, program, and that also uh, occurred during the summer. So in all, um, we uh, quadrupled the number of students participating, but more importantly, used those experiences uh, to tune our instructional practices in preparation for the uh, hybrid learning, uh, which we'll explain in a little bit more detail, and you'll, you'll get a sense uh, over the next few minutes what that hybrid learning uh, program will look like at the middle school. But we also are preparing for the eventuality of virtual learning, which will be full virtual. And so it's been three-dimensional chess, so to speak, but uh, we have a great deal of confidence because our leadership team, and you'll meet um, several members of our leadership team uh, this, uh, this evening, and our teachers have just done an outstanding job um, making, uh, designing, preparing, prototyping, testing, and ultimately uh, we'll be putting it into uh, uh, practice in uh, just a few weeks. Can we move on to the next slide? Yes, sir. 
not cooperating. I don't know what's going on. My keyboard yeah. control doesn't seem to be working. I think I had that experience. I was going to say, I, I, I gave I you a hard full time. experience. You did. And so I turned the, the uh, controls control. back to you. Thank you. Uh, so you. the, um, the summer programs for faculty are actually a, um, a, an incredible source of pride for Harrison. Over the past uh, decade, actually more, we've run summer programs that rival perhaps some of the uh, largest professional development programs in the region, if not in the country, as a school district. And over time, our faculty in uh, partnership with our leadership team have become the experts who are training other faculty uh, providing consultation, developing collaborative teamwork. And this year, um, as a, a result of the, um, well, as I said, unprecedented circumstances, we took the opportunity to shift the program from a, a model that was designed around 15 hours of instruction to a model that was uh, designed around shorter, uh, more intense, rigorous um, units of study that you know, we called modular. So we have teachers uh, who have uh, basically been uh, taking anywhere from three to six modules, uh, some as many as uh, nine modules this summer, um, and over 1,400 registrants, um, which comprises more than 70% of our faculty have been participating in this, uh, in our professional program this summer. And uh, among the 75 online workshops, we have uh, programs that have provided training in synchronized instruction using Zoom, Google Meet, um, in a range of uh, applications and tools, social emotional learning, including trauma and trauma-informed instruction. Um, more than 150 teachers have participated in uh, both asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities. Um, you can see these, uh, the range of courses if you want to see the kind of training that teachers are participating in on our website. Um, Lou mentioned curriculum writing projects, and we just want to emphasize that um, uh, the elementary teachers produced more than 500 asynchronous elementary lessons as part of our design. The middle school and high school produced a number of lessons, but because it's departmentalized, we're, we're, um, it looks very different. It's far more specialized. And um, at the secondary level, um, we have uh, invested an additional 500 hours um, above and beyond the thousand hours that the organization has supported teachers in collaborative curriculum writing to prepare for uh, the uh, hybrid and virtual learning. And the only thing I would add, Michael, is that the summer professional development is not in the past tense. I walked into a That's group true. today that were online with uh, Facing History, a large number of faculty and uh, I think uh, I walked into Ms. Snyder's office and she was in the midst of her training. She was and our program this summer was was and is entirely virtual um, and that's by design to ensure that the uh, full experience that faculty have they're able to transfer to the classroom in the fall. So if you were to try to compare the experience that students were having in March, April, and May to what we've designed for and planned for um, in September going forward. It, it's not comparable. Um, we are as prepared as an organization can be from an instructional perspective, from a curricular perspective, uh, from a support perspective, from a technological perspective. And that's not to say we don't have uh, areas for growth and new learning, but um, the preparation has been extraordinary. And teachers have committed extraordinary amount of time to being prepared. This slide just tries to frame the, the process that we've gone through. We uh, took a look at our curriculum and we're not the only ones. Um, IB just released uh, new guidelines and their releases are, are coming in steps. Uh, looking at the, Mar uh, the May 2021 um, IB exam schedule just as a, a point of reference and They've made changes to their curriculum as we have made changes to our curriculum. We call it essentializing curriculum, but basically we review every unit of study, every learning standard to determine what's essential, what's the most important, so that should we need to compact, um, condense learning, we do it in a way that's meaningful, a way that's standards-based and that ensures that students are meeting both New York State and our international standards that we hold um, you know, accountable to whether we are in a 
full face-to-face -face learning, in-person school as we know it, whether we are fully online or whether we are developing um, and working within a hybrid model. So you'll find as our um, uh, instructional leaders, curriculum directors speak about this and our teachers speak about this, you'll see examples of, of how we've planned for maintaining not only continuity of learning, but extremely high standards of learning. Thank you, Michael. Now, sometimes it seems to be cooperating and sometimes not. Okay. There you go. This so, is a, about something we learned last night about terminology, is that right? Yes, um, so we, we added this uh, slide to take a moment and pause and make sure that the audience knows when we talk about synchronous and asynchronous, what these terms mean. First, when we talk about hybrid, there are probably more than 100 hybrid models of learning. Hybrid basically means that we have in-person learning and we have um, online learning and at some ratio for our organization, um, for uh, Lewis M. Klein Middle School, it's every other day. So students are in a cohort on day A, um, they're in class and that's 50% of the class and in, in day B, they will be working, um, learning from home. Synchronous, students are engaging in either live instruction or online instruction in time. So in a scheduled uh, period of time, when we talk about asynchronous, we're talking about learning from home. Um, time that is structured, it's by design, the activities, the learning activities, but students have more flexibility as to when they complete them. And that would happen uh, during a given day, but um, it wouldn't be assigned and it wouldn't be monitored um, during their learning from home uh, experience. Before I go to the next slide, I'd like to just take a pause and just, because in a second, we're gonna show you a sample schedule, what it will be like from the, the eyes of a student, but just wanna monitor the chat box. A couple of things, uh, Brian, if a child tests positive, all children that child was around during class also need to follow quarantining protocols. You wanna just remind people of who's in charge of that? Sure. Uh, so any question about the need to quarantine or isolate will be based on guidance from the Department of Health. But to answer the question in brief, um, the only requirement to quarantine is typically based on what's called a close contact. And a close contact is defined as somebody that's had contact of less than six feet distance for more than 10 minutes. So assuming that students and uh, staff are adhering to the guidelines for the social distancing and the wearing of masks, uh, we should be in a very limited circumstance where we would have um, those kinds of close contacts with exposure. Yeah, and there's a number of questions about siblings. So here's the what we can tell you about siblings. If the middle school and high school are on the same schedule, the elementary school is on a different schedule. If you have siblings in the elementary school, unless you ask otherwise, they'll be placed on the same day. The same is true at the middle and high school and in the middle school. If you just have middle school kids, they'll be on the same day. If they're in a middle school, high school, unless there's some rare anomaly, the siblings will always be placed on the, the same day. We've had some requests for folks who don't want their siblings on the same day. You can come up with your own meaning as to what that's about. But um, So that should answer the sibling question. I just want to address a, a very uh, profound question that we have struggled with. What about working parents? Um, we are trying to work and the town board and the mayor are doing everything that they can, but we have yet to find a way to provide low cost childcare for working families. We have certainly not given up. I've made some calls to the county executive and I know that the town is doing the same. We hope to have more on that soon. Dr. Ladewick and I uh, toured some buildings. Our problem is A, we don't have the resources nor do we have the space to provide uh, the number of uh, folks that would require that. But we are thinking of you, and if we can come up with something collaboratively, we certainly will. But this is um, a very important slide, and I think those of you watching at home um, will find it useful. There are two slides. This is the first. Mr. Freed will take you through it. Um, we believe that um, the hybrid model that we've designed will support continuity of learning. So let me just clarify one thing because it is a recurring question. In Right now, classes are essentially at half the size 
If we go into a fully virtual model, those classes will remain at half the size because Michael, uh, working with teachers and looking at lots of research, and I discovered that if you want meaningful engagement in a Zoom setting or a virtual setting, you need to keep those class sizes limited so that teachers can actually do the kind of comprehensive check-in assessment, um, checking for understanding that's necessary to be effective. With 22 or 24 in a, in a setting like that, it is much more confounding. So we'd rather have high quality experiences linked to meaningful extended work and check-ins on the alternate days. So to say again, the hybrid model will look the same if we go fully virtual. And if you are wondering about what happens if you're in the virtual model, you will have the same experience. When the kids are learning in school, you'll be zooming in. When the kids are um, at home, you'll be at home working on you independently. So Scott, you want to take us through what that looks like? Sure. Um, so what you're looking at is two weeks in the life of students. And, and at the top of each week, you can see the team pride or group pride, not to confuse you because the middle school has teams, but you have pride in Husky. And what happens is, as I think Michael just alluded to before, the students are going to be in on-site learning every other day and learning from home. So if you look at the top and you see the pride group, on Monday, they're in school for on-site learning and they have a traditional nine period scheduled day. Um, for those who are asking the question of what if I choose the virtual option, we use on-site learning because that's where the teacher is. Um, that's where right now our students are, but obviously if someone chooses the option of, of you know, logging in and remote in, we're still gonna call it on-site learning at the moment. Um, when the students go to the next day, they'll be home doing asynchronous learning and there will be opportunities for synchronous learning, which we'll mention as we go through the next few slides. It alternates like that if you follow through just looking at the top maroon color, on-site Monday, home Tuesday, on-site Wednesday, home Thursday, and on and on. Now, at the bottom, you see the Husky group, and they're running the opposite, thus splitting the classes in half. You're either going to be on Pride or Husky. The divisions have been made after, you know, the same way we go through all the process that Dr. Will mentioned earlier, we already do that first and we have the groupings and then we divide it in half with the same careful process done by the three guidance counselors in the middle school and Mr. Speck, the assistant principal in charge of scheduling. Um, the reason why you see, if you look underneath Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and you see day one, day one, day two, day two, is because the schools at the middle school and high school run on a six day cycle. Most classes run every other day, like, you know, sort of odd and even, but there are a few that run in the six day cycle, music lessons, um, some speech and uh, counseling rotations. And so to ensure that students meet all their requirements and all their classes, we run back to back day ones. Therefore, the students who are in the building on the, you know, in pride will have day one and then you go home and you continue with day one the next day. So if you, know, if you have a music class or a physical education class, you wouldn't be missing it over and over again. So it runs through. And after two weeks, plus if you went to the next week, you would have completed um, day six, day six, and then it would go and begin again. And so in the simplest way of looking at it is that if you're in any group of students, you're going to be home one day doing asynchronous learning, in school the next, or Zooming in for a typical nine-period scheduled day. The next slide, if you can switch to it. Now this gives you kind of a view of what it's like during the day. Um, if you, this is a, just a sample schedule and it doesn't matter if you're a Husky or a Pride kid. This is for any random sixth grader. Um, I chose sixth grade because you know, the least familiar might be those of you who have students who are new to the building. Now the school runs through a nine period day, but I was pointing out earlier in some of my things I mentioned is that we sometimes shift kids at different times during the day. So if you look at this child, on Monday, they're in school. They begin with that home base and silent sustained reading, as I mentioned earlier. If you look straight down the line, just to take that view, on Tuesday when they're home, we expect them to do independent reading. And then when they're on Wednesday, they're gonna have an advisory session. And when they're home, they'll run independent reading. And that's that 20 minutes to start their day. And while it's not a requirement when you're home, I highly recommend if you're looking for a structured day, to follow the same path you're going through with school. Get up in the morning, have some breakfast, get dressed, sit down and do some quiet reading and it's reading for your own pleasure in the beginning of the day. 
The student then, if you go to the top of Monday, runs through a 60 minute block of ELA and a 60 minute block of social studies. That is three periods, but I'm showing it you like this because I want you to get a feel for the fact that students have a 60 minute class back to back. And when they're home, they'll have extended learning on Tuesday in ELA and social studies. You're gonna hear in detail later about what that looks like from one of our science teachers and one of our social studies teachers. And if you look at the pattern down the line, if you went from Monday all the way through the day, you'll see it's not you know, atypical compared to many schools. You'll have English and social studies, physical education. You have a lunch in the middle of the day. This child takes Italian. Some will take French or Spanish. You'll have art, which is one of our rotations, and then math and science. But if you point your eyes to Wednesday, um, you'll see that math and science is in the morning because in the middle school, your classes rotate thus giving students a chance for an hour of maths and science every other day and an hour of English and social studies every other day. Or in this case, we're running day one, day one, day two, day two. Um, physical education alternates with orchestra. And so you can see that there. And that's, this kind of gives you day one, day one, day two, day two again. I only gave you uh, Monday to Friday because I didn't want to put too much on here to overwhelm everyone's eyes. Um, if you look down to Thursday, and you look across and you see that the student had, is at home. I wanted to point something out that I think is important. So here's a student at home. They have their independent reading time. They've done their math. They've done their science extended learning. You'll hear about orchestra extended learning. And now they get to about 1230 in the day. And it says art extended learning and it alternates or it has a slash for an orchestra lesson. Orchestra lessons, band lessons, they're gonna be in the virtual world. So it's an opportunity here that the orchestra teacher would be in a synchronous world with the student. The student would be online with the teacher getting direct instruction in the lesson. So it's one of those examples that people have asked, well, will my teachers be available during the day when I'm home? We also are gonna have numerous opportunities throughout the course of the day where teachers are gonna be there for check-ins, um, extra help, office hours, that schedule will be put together and teachers will share that with their individual students. Lots of opportunities during the day and some of them after the day or even in the morning as well. But this kind of gives you that view of what's gonna, life going to be like. And, you know, one of the things that's important to note is that while I've given you a recommendation here to follow the pattern of the day, um, as Michael showed in the slide earlier, when you're in the asynchronous day, so in this case, it's Tuesday and Thursday of this week for a child, there is flexibility. I am not saying that the student must do their ELA work from 817 to 917. Um, they may choose to you know, do their independent reading and they fell in love with their book and they read from until 830. By all means, we highly recommend that at their own pace. Stop, take a snack, work for 30 minutes. The flexibility is there, but I would start for any parent um, with a organized schedule like this. And if it's easier for you to follow it based on things like 930, 1030, then We'll work with you. That's where our counselors, our assistant principals, and the teacher are all here to work with you and map out a perfect schedule. But I would always recommend following each class along the day so your student feels like when they go back to school, it's the same way. And later on in the presentation, you will hear from P teachers and you'll actually see what does it mean to be asynchronously learning in social studies or, or science or um, What's the other way? Math tonight, right? Yeah. No, tonight is science and social studies. Um, last night we presented uh, math and language arts as well as social studies. Okay. So let's just go along. So this is a sort of a highlight of six to eight learning from home day. Yeah, I'm going to invite, if it's okay, well, I'm going to invite um, Jen Egan, our new assistant principal, to join me for part of this. I was stuff. going to make that suggestion. Those of you who don't know Jen Egan, she was an incredibly successful foreign language teacher at our high school and she has led the implementation of the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program as the coordinator. And uh, she was in our Future School Leaders Academy, where we cultivate talented teachers to take on leadership roles in our organization. She's one of nine, and uh, she's been just incredibly helpful to all of us throughout this entire experience. Good evening, Jen. Good evening, and thank you, Dr. Wool. Uh, so I'm just going to speak a little bit uh, broadly about what the learning from home day could look like before we hear some specific uh, examples from our teachers. Um, so our six to eight learning from home day is a day where students engage in asynchronous self-directed teacher developed learning experience is throughout each of their content areas. And we really see the learning from home day as a, an opportunity uh, for students to approach their work independently and self paced 
and also to have multiple viewings or uh, additional access to materials uh, that they might not otherwise have if, say, a lesson weren't recorded or if materials weren't posted on Google Classroom. Google Classroom will be the platform that we're using for student assignments and, of course, we'll be there to support students with learning this technology, learning this platform. Uh, we see this day as a way for teachers to set up work for the next day or to deepen the understanding from the previous day's work. And what we're really excited about for this day is that students can have the opportunity to collaborate in a remote environment with their peers, which is something that they are missing out on because of the restrictions put in place by social distancing. So whereas a student might not be able to work on the same poster board with another student during class, on the asynchronous day, they can collaborate on a Google Doc and create a similar product. While students might not be able to sit closely with one another and share presentations, students on the asynchronous day could create Google Slides and have a Google Meet and essentially engage in a virtual gallery walk of one another's work. So we're really excited that this day can be used to give students those experiences that we know that they'll be missing. Um, and also, as Mr. Freed said, uh, we will be using the asynchronous days uh, for opportunities for support services, for band and orchestra lessons, extracurricular activities that will be individually scheduled, and as a way for our students to connect with our teachers uh, during their uh, office hours and extra help sessions should the need arise. Thank you, Jen. That's a comprehensive description of uh, an asynchronous day. Michael, I think I want to turn this back to you for a minute because this kind of synthesizes um, what we were talking about, what teachers have actually been doing, or are we going to have Marlene do this? I'm not sure. Lou, yeah, Lou can I? Lou, if Ms. Colonna is going to. Go ahead, Scott. Okay, I just wanted to share, share one, one point. Uh, you, you skipped over a slide. Um, I did. I, I think it's an important thing to, to reference here. We found during the time when students were home, that the challenge, of course, was that they weren't in school. But we did find that some students excelled in the work from working from home. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we have here is an opportunity. And I wanted the community to understand that the asynchronous learning married together with the synchronous opportunities in school every other day, we think is going to have some real advantage. We've learned that a lot of our students who were very successful working at their own pace, but they need the structure, giving them the structure every other day with the learning from home is, is a very good balance for them. So we see a great opportunity here. So you meant a bullet, not a slide. You made me nuts there for a minute. But I also think, you know, I can tell you a good story. Uh, there were many high school students that said to me they had great success because they were able to sleep later and manage their own time. So there are some potential positives, but I think Mr. Fried, your point is well taken that you need to assess your own student your own child and say how much structure is useful, how much is restrictive. So to the extent you can give kids some independence, as Jen pointed out, it, it could be really advantageous. We've seen kids shine in this model. But we, in order to, for kids to shine, the asynchronous days have to be deep and thoughtful and well-planned. So I'm gonna introduce our director of social studies who is truly an expert in curriculum design and has done just incredible work supporting uh, teachers and helping them to develop curriculum. She's going to explain to you what, uh, what exactly has been going on with the curriculum redesign. Marlene? Yes, thank you, Dr. Liu. I'd like to take a few minutes to explain to you the design process behind the hybrid model. The model's been designed to maximize the benefits of face-to-face -face instruction, which can take place through a live Zoom or actually in the classroom in front of the teacher, and the benefits that have been mentioned of asynchronous instruction, which essentially I think we should think about as guided practice from home. In the typical 40 minute period, six through 12, three types of learning generally take place. There's teacher directed and facilitated learning, there's peer collaboration, and then there's independent guided practice that takes place in the classroom. Jen did a wonderful job of explaining many of the opportunities for collaboration that might take place on these asynchronous days. In addition to that, the vast majority of this independent practice will also take place on asynchronous days. 
Some of the examples of things that students will do during asynchronous days are um, on our slide here. If we're at the beginning of a unit, um, introductory materials might be presented, things like initial videos that create context. We call that the flipped classroom. It tapes a lecture or a video that doesn't necessarily require teacher guidance and children can watch it from home. As we move into the unit, student inquiry can take place. Students can research um, an aspect of the lesson the day before that really sparked their interests and they can report out to the rest of their class so that students can learn from one another when they come back together face to face. And then towards the end of a lesson, we always engage in several reflective acti activities that help students set goals. Um, things like journaling and self-evaluation, and those are also activities that can take place on the asynchronous day. All of these activities used to take place in the classroom, and, and the great advantage of having it take place in the classroom is that the teacher is there. The teacher is there to answer questions, the teacher is there to redirect students, and most of the time the teacher is just there to reassure a student that they're, they're on the right track. For asynchronous learning to be successful, we have to find a way to restructure these supports and scaffolds for students when they're at home. Our teachers have gone to tremendous efforts to create support for students while they're learning at home. They've taped themselves lecturing so that students can rewatch a lecture from the day before. They've anticipated questions that students might have with an assignment and created frequently asked questions page so that kids can go to the page and look and see and receive some direction on the assignment they're working on. They've posted exemplar papers that show examples of proficient and distinguished work so that a student who's working can see you know, how the work that they're, they're doing kind of measures up to some standards. And of course, there's always email and there will be extra help during these days. So students are not on their own when they're moving through this work. They're well supported. It's been mentioned that this is actually an opportunity and I just like to take a minute to think about what are some of the benefits of independent guided learning. One of the great benefits is that it allows students to move at their own pace. If I'm watching a lecture that's been taped, I can stop, pause, I can go rewind, or maybe even I want to fast forward because I already know all of this information. It provides a greater opportunity for student agency and choice and assignments. When we're all in the classroom together, we're all learning the same thing, but this provides an opportunity for kids to do a deeper dive into something that just is personally more interesting to them. So that provides an opportunity for greater personalized instruction. And finally, it allows students to practice the skill sets that are going to be so important to their later success in high school. Skill sets like organizing yourself in time and space, sticking to a schedule that works for you and learning who you are as, as a learner, and thinking about what are the resources online where I can go when I have a question instead of throwing my hand up in the air immediately and waiting for a teacher. And one of the benefits, particularly in middle school, of asynchronous instruction is that the teachers have very thoughtfully prepared explicit instruction in these soft skills. So they're going to be teaching kids when we're face to face how to organize themselves and be successful on asynchronous days. Kids will have an opportunity to try out that and then they'll reflect with the teacher again and set personal goals. Teachers are providing a very purposeful asynchronous lessons and that's really what is the most important here. The material that's been moved to the asynchronous days has been chosen because it really works in this environment. It might appear because we're only in school 50% of the time that kids are only learning 50% of the information and nothing could be further from the truth. Asynchronous learning is not homework and it's not a simple review. It's either an extension of learning that happened the day before or new learning that sets up a deeper experience that's going to happen when they come back into the classroom. I think it would be incredibly helpful right now to invite Alana Gaza, one of our excellent sixth grade teachers, to show you what this might look like for a typical sixth grader in social studies during a week. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, description. I think if I were a parent hearing that, it answered a lot of the critical questions. Is it really going to mean that my child's only going to be about half the content? And in fact, it isn't. And I, I also think the way you described the process of how teachers have gone through so thoughtfully and decided which learning objectives fit better in synchronous or asynchronous. And I know we're gonna 
be impressed with the next person joining us because I've taken a look at this work and it's just wonderful. And this is sort of how, I know there are some students watching at home. Here's a real sense of what it's gonna be like when you come back to school. Alana, so, you're on. Yeah, thanks. Um, so like Ms. Colonna said, uh, my name is Alana Brown. I teach sixth grade social studies. Um, so through teaching LMK summer humanities course in July, I actually really learned a lot about how to best reach my students in both of these environments, um, in the synchronous and the asynchronous world and what supports would make the work most accessible for them. Uh, this week at a glance, you know, along with being influenced by that is also the result of multiple summer professional development courses that I took in order to help me learn, you know, the best modalities for instruction, you know, in this blending learning environment that we all find ourselves in. Uh, so this week that you're looking at is imagining a portion of one of my favorite units and usually one of the kids favorite units, which is on the Roman classical age. Um, so if we look at day one, which would be an in-person day, the objective for that would be for students to analyze under what conditions a civilization achieves greatness. You know, that would be a lot of teacher-directed, direct instruction, um, activity for students annotating, you know, extracting evidence from a text. Again, with me there, you know, with those supports in place. Um, for the end of that day, doing an exit ticket, you know, a survey to check for understanding. And that survey would then really influence, you know, how day two would look for those students, you know, to help inform me as their teacher what comes next and what they need in place for them to be successful on their at home day. So if we look at day two, which would be virtual, you know, for this group of students, they're, um, it, they'd be doing a student-driven inquiry, you know, so this project-based learning to explain one contributing factor of this golden age of Rome. Um, so really students would have a choice there, you know, if they want to do a deep dive into Rome's government, you know, if they're interested in politics, into technology, into art and architecture, you know, whatever really um, they want, they could do, whatever piques their interest. An example of how they might do that on an asynchronous day you know, I might use Pear Deck, which is a great program where I can record myself um, annotating, modeling, you know, showing students what their slide in their collaborative slideshow might look like. So if we look at the activity there, they'd be collaborating with each other on their chosen topic, you know, making this slideshow. Um, and again, I'd be checking in on their learning through Google Classroom, you know, through their student work. And of course, I'd be available through email, you know, if students had questions that day. Day three, you know, they'd be back in person with me. And the objective for that would be to synthesize each student's portion of the research into a cohesive presentation uh, together. And, you know, in class, doing some more direct instruction, some more modeling, giving feedback, you know, from teachers, from their group members, from other peers. And again, you know, using an exit ticket there to really inform their instruction for that day four. You know, so students would develop a plan, you know, with their group members, what will they edit, what will they revise in their slideshow. So day four, you know, again, they'd be evaluating in light of their feedback and making edits. Uh, using a rubric, using exemplars that I would provide for them. I would also probably utilize a Padlet that day, which is a great online discussion uh, interactive board where students could post questions, concerns about their upcoming day five presentation. That way, before I go on for, you know, a Zoom extra help that day with them, I could look at kind of the common areas of concern and get through those quickly and then move on to more student specific questions to make the best of our time together on those asynchronous days. Again, having some extra help um, and again, checking in through Google Classroom on their work and how it's going. And then day five. The Sorry. final day in this uh, would be to demonstrate their comprehensive understanding of the golden age of Rome, you know, through a final share out of their presentations. And, you know, we would also have a feedback loop in place, you know, whether that is verbally or digitally with the other students in the room. And again, their final learning here being those final presentations that they made with their group. Um, and like Ms. Egan and Ms. Colonna both mentioned, uh, one takeaway, especially as sixth grade teachers from the spring, is that these asynchronous days are really a great time for our sixth graders to learn how to be a little more independent and learn these skills that are really gonna help them to be successful, you know, as they move on through middle school, through high school and beyond. Alana, that was wonderful. It makes me wanna study Rome. <laughs> I, I know that some parents are having some anxiety because uh, their fifth graders are coming in 
I'm going to ask an obvious question, but they don't have to know how to use Padlet and all of these things. There's a, there's a lot that you do to get kids ready and comfortable with the tools. You want to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this um, model is assuming that we've obviously had some time with them first where students would be very comfortable, you know, using Google slideshows, using Google Classroom, using Padlet, Pear Deck. You know, these are all things that we'll work towards in our synchronous days to get students really comfortable with them. And having seen the outcome firsthand, I think the kids actually learned this quite well. And it is to go back to Jen Egan's point, it's another way for kids to connect. And that is just as important as almost the, the lesson. The other thing I want to point out, because I've learned this myself watching your hard work this summer and all of our teachers, this is no longer about planning a lesson. You really need to look at the arc of your unit to figure out how to plan learning objectives and where they best fit. So just a wonderful piece of work. Thank you so much for, for taking time to do this tonight. We really do appreciate it. I believe, Michael, you have to help me. Is this uh, Mrs. O'Keefe? Dr. O'Keefe. I, I, oh, I so apologize. Uh, Dr. O'Keefe, my mistake. Welcome, Joan. Thanks for being here. I know we're going to hear from our teachers soon, but I know you wanted to help us sort of understand how this process unfolded. Thank you, Dr. Wool. Uh, I just wanted to share with everyone the process that we have been going through as a science department over the past couple of months uh, to prepare for this September. So the first thing that we did was we reflected on our student learning experiences in the spring and the summer. And uh, we took away from that the things that went well and also the things that we needed to improve upon. And from there, the six through eight or six through 12 science department set goals. And uh, some of the things that we wanted to focus on were rigor, student engagement, and the inclusion of laboratory work. Uh, most importantly, we wanted to make sure that we used effective teaching and learning practices and made best use of synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Uh, from there, we developed two science-specific professional development modules for teachers to participate in over the summer. One of them focused on adapting labs or finding alternative labs that will work in a hybrid learning environment and also uh, designing Another module was focused on designing highly effective science uh, lessons for the hybrid environment. And all of this preparation uh, prepared our teachers to come in over the summer and write curriculum for grade six physical science, grade seven life science, and grade eight earth and space science. And one of our teachers is here with us tonight, uh, eighth grade, Ms. Chelsea Chiaffi, and she is going to show you an example of how all of this work the teachers have been doing over the summer plays out in an eighth grade science classroom over one week. Ms. Thank Chiaffi? You, you, before she starts, I just want to commend you because I know one of the great challenges to keeping a high quality science program was trying to figure out how to reproduce labs in a virtual setting. And I just think the work that you did with our teachers is, is going to keep our very excellent science program vital. So just thank you so much for all that. Thank you. Work. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. All right. Where is our guest star? There she is. Hi, Chelsea. Thanks for being here tonight. Hi, thank you. So uh, my name is Chelsea Shafi. I teach eighth grade science. Um, so what you see here is a week at a glance for our first unit of the year, which is interactions in earth systems. And throughout this week, we'll be investigating the essential question of how do scientists represent the earth's 3D surface landscape on a 2D map? So looking at really topographic maps in this unit. Um, when I met with my team during one of our professional development modules this summer, we took a look at how we taught this um, essential question last year, and we realized we really didn't need to change much about how we taught it. We just needed to decide what information could be best taught at home and what information was best for in the classroom. So um, after going through the lessons that we have used previously, we kind of pulled it out and decided that at home would be a nice place. You could see here as an example for um, the Husky group on a Monday at home would be the best place to build some background knowledge. So students are learning what a topographic map is. They're going to build some vocabulary. This could be done using Edpuzzle videos, um, vocabulary application apps, uh, various opportunities to explore background knowledge of topography here. The next day when they're in school, we have an opportunity to do a hands-on lab. Finding opportunities to engage students in um, labs is definitely been difficult to think about in this new environment, but when we can find a place to do it, we're finding ways to engage them. So here they're going to construct a 2D 
topographic map using a 3D landscape. Um, following up at home will be a flip direct lesson. So this could be a um, video like you heard about earlier, where we record going over how do we interpret topographic maps and students will work through it at their own pace where they could go back and rewatch parts they're confused on. Um, followed by our in school day where they're then going to be able to apply what they learned at home. So this is an opportunity with the teacher with their peers um, to be able to practice interpreting topographic maps ask any questions they had from the day before that they got stuck on and clarify anything that they needed to go over. And then it'll end with an extension of learning at home where they're gonna use their understanding of topographic maps to learn what a watershed is and how humans negatively impact them. So this is gonna allow them to do some um, exploration and inquiry into how humans impact watersheds and connecting topography to the real world. Throughout the week, we'll have built in exit tickets to assess students on their understanding when they're at home. So we have an idea of what we need to reinforce when they're back in front of us in school um, and extra help throughout the week as well to make sure that students have the opportunity to check in and ask any questions they need. Boy, you made that sound easy. <laughs> I just need to point out as somebody who taught for over 20 years, the level of uh, planning that Chelsea and Alana have to go into to make these lessons meaningful is exponentially greater than it would be in a traditional classroom. Preparing all of this individualized instruction to be meaningful really does require great thinking and an awful lot of time. So, Lou, may, may I add that um, you could uh, uh, take a teacher from any of the science uh, uh, classes and put them in this and you would see the same level of, of planning and design. This is a model that um, is uh, emerging out of uh, work that we have started many, many years ago, but has come to fruition under the, um, you know, as we're designing uh, this hybrid learning. Chelsea, that was uh, wonderful. Alana, thank you so much for yeah, really. thank bringing you. these examples. It gives, I think it really helps people to get a sense that their, their children are gonna be deeply engaged in learning, whether they're in front of you or not. And folks, I know some of you are asking lots of virtual learning questions. We're gonna to get to them all. It's part of the presentation. I promise you I'm not ignoring the questions. I just know what's coming. Um, Dr. Wolf, I could just um, jump in for a minute. Um, I just, I wanted to share with um, everyone who's watching that one, uh, I, got, I received a lot of um, uh, feedback and, and messages and calls today. And, one of the things that I think um, people watching last night, and I'm sure people who have just um, watched our teachers present tonight, is just how much work goes into um, creating this kind of a learning environment. Um, it's not just putting up a camera and teaching on a different day or giving out some handouts. Um, so. Um, thank you to them, and I think it is important that we all recognize, as particularly as parents, just how challenging this is for teachers um, and how much work has gone in over this summer to making sure that we are in the best place possible um, to make this as successful as possible in this really difficult environment. Thank you for saying that because I, I, as I said last night, I closed on this, but since you brought it up, I couldn't be prouder of the amount of time, effort, and energy the leadership team, and I include teachers as part of our leadership team, have devoted to the instructional part of this. The PPE and all of that stuff is confounding, but this is the work we know, and this is the work that they have worked so hard at getting ready and getting ready to do it well. And uh, it's, it's just a credit to who they are as professionals. Thank, thank you both. I'm, I promise you I'm trying to change these slides and sometimes they just go beautifully. I'm so delighted to introduce this next young man. He has had an extraordinary impact in his brief time here. Although I say brief, he just received tenure. Mr. Galano is going to join us and what you will see um, I, I hope you don't have any stereotypical impressions about physical education and health because for us it's a very important part of the day, important part of the learning experience and what you will see is he's also done an incredible job of bringing his uh, department forward and partnering directly with the special education department and our school psychologist to bring SEL into the physical education program. Chris, are you there? Well, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Wool. Um, so as far as physical education uh, is concerned, 
The major difference in uh, some of the protocols, and, and you heard Dr. Will speak about it before, is that uh, when there's aerobic activity or in, in layman's terms, heavy breathing, hopefully, um, <laughs> they are recommending that kids are 12 feet uh, or mandating they're 12 feet apart wearing masks. Um, we'll also limit the use of equipment for obvious reasons, um, you know, transmitting bacteria and such. Um, so there'll be little to no sharing of equipment for the first um, couple of weeks. That was recommended by the state and um, uh, you know, other agencies. Uh, the PE schedule alternate, just like any other, um, any of the subjects you heard about, PE is an every other day class. Uh, the model that was created, and I know uh, Scott, Mr. Freed spoke about this, but we wanted to ensure, which I appreciate, uh, that people were not missing PE um, as a class because um, as much as the academic and content uh, classes are very important, you know, I feel that the physical education program in, in Harrison has really been thriving and the kids have really been benefiting from it. Um, and it's not only about the physical part of it, but the mental part, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. So synchronous learning on the days that your child's in person um, or in front of the teacher, we have uh, put out a premium activity time. Obviously we want our kids or your kids moving as much as possible. Um, it's heartbreaking to see that kids are sitting behind a computer even more. Um, and all the studies show that there's obviously more stress and anxiety. So the days that they're in front of our teachers, they are going to be moving um, in a safe manner, but they will be uh, moving. We'll emphasize getting outside as much as possible. Um, we have a great facility with a brand new, uh, you know, turf uh, field with other parts that they can go to. So they will be out as much as possible. Some of the units that are there, um, icebreakers, team building, foot and eye coordination, fitness, yoga, and mindfulness. As you can see, we took the stereo, stereotypical PE and threw it out the window. Um, we believe in wellness, not just for your, the physical or team sport model. Um, we are looking at making it uh, the best experience for all. Um, additionally, uh, an asynchronous day, just like any other subject, and I know Marlene uh, spoke to this, but our asynchronous learning will be directly related to or um, in direct relation to the synchronous learning. So anything that your child's doing on the asynchronous day, um, it's not going to be any large or, or you, know, in, you know, major assignment, but it's going to help your, your child um, either preview or um, enhance the, the, less, the live lesson. So that could be in mini assignments, journals and reflections, video clips, recorded mini lessons, shared articles, fitness logs, uh, things like that to really ensure that your students or your children are um, learning because obviously again not to hammer it home but there's a lot of depression and anxiety going on in our PE staff um, I would say and, and I appreciate Dr. Will talking about it but I would put them up against anyone in the state or country um, with their skill set so the bottom point it says the middle school staff they've already started to um, and actually they met a couple of weeks ago and, and have been meeting a bunch of times since then um, the physical education staff is meeting and, and collaborating with our school psychologists in most districts. You would never hear that um, in Harrison. You do. And um, what they are doing is they're, re they're providing recorded lessons. So this will take place on the asynchronous days. Um, and some of you might see SEL or DBT and not know what they are, which is fine. Um, social emotional learning is obviously uh, something that is very important and how we kind of collaborated with um, the special ed department. Julie Schneider recognized that the PE teachers have a great, build great relationships with the kids. Um, kids often go to the PE teachers and health teacher with their personal issues or just to you know, get a break and to talk. Um, so we thought that it was a great opportunity to, to uh, mold the two. So um, on days that they're asynchronous PE, um, there will be opportunities where our PE teachers and school psychologists will be recording lessons for your students to, uh, your children to uh, engage in. So it's something that we are extremely proud of. Um, my, our teachers, I know Jay Sirocco and Tarek Frisch are on right now. Um, you know, they uh, really took this and, and um, you know, I've driven it forward, but the entire staff from the beginning 
um, understood the importance of the social emotional aspect of it and um, were eager to be a part of it um, and never really pushed back. They just wanted to do more for the kids and understood that um, their role in the school is not only to be a, a, a great physical education teacher, um, but the emotional part and the relationship part that they do. So we are very excited about it. Um, I can guarantee that it will look different than what it did in the spring. Um, and we're you know, ready to get going with it. So we appreciate the support and the partnership with the uh, special ed department and also the mental health team. Thank you, Chris. And I'm just going to add three things to sort of address some of the questions in the box. Um, we will be talking about clubs, sports, and extracurricular in a few minutes. DBT stands for Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. When I get Julie Snyder on, she'll tell you chapter and verse. But what it really does is it, and the physical educators are doing such a great job of this, helping kids learn how to cope and manage their own conversations and a sense of agency, all the things that we want kids to develop. So I'm, I'm couldn't be prouder of them. And unfortunately tonight, you know, we, we, if you looking at the screen, it is filled with administrators and teachers. Um, I can speak for the administrative staff. Virtually no one has had a day off. We have a, a wonderful young man that we hired maybe what, three weeks ago, Chris? Yep. Daniel Gonzalez, who is the new assistant athletic director, replaced the beloved Tom Lehman, who went on to be an athletic director. And he's just a bit, Danny has done tremendous work. He's still catching up. And we collectively decided because it was his daughter's birthday tonight that he should have the night off because uh, he's, he, he's, a, he's a good family man and he, uh, he needs some time at home because he's been thrown to the wolves in his first three weeks. But thank you for covering all of that, Chris. Just great work. Um, Dr. Wool, if I could add just, I know there are a lot of some new parents on um, with rising sixth graders, um, is that our assistant athletic director is actually housed at the middle school. Um, mm -hmm. And so well, is another um, direct connection um, who I, I am sure will follow in, in Tom Lehman's footsteps and develop really great relationships, not only with the students, but with all of the teachers in the building and parents. So um, we're really excited to welcome him. Yeah, and we have been so excited. He's just taken to the model. Actually, I saw him today and said, don't come um, <laughs> because he needed a break. He's been doing great work with Jen Egan and Scott Spector, who's also on this call. They get, as Chris said, the strength of this program is they focus on building relationships with students, whether they're athletes or not. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a safe harbor for kids. And I couldn't be prouder of everything that that department has done. And if Julie Snyder were, were speaking right now, she'd be so effusive, I'd have to mute her. She already texted me saying she, already texted she was me. excited about the announcement. Um, mm -hmm. And also Danny, just an example, um, even today I was just speaking with him and he, I know he reached out to the uh, middle school administration because he wants to get to know the kids right away. So he was um, volunteering for bus duty, which is, um, you know, that's something to say if you, if you're going to be out there and, uh, rain or shine to, to welcome these kids. So it, it was just a little, um, you know, intro to who he is. And, and he, you know, thought right away that that was a great way of meeting kids. So he's going to be a great asset as well. And I want to preach, I want to thank the board of ed and, and Lou and the, you know, the administration to uh, support that position. Well, you did a great job finding another very talented young man. So thank you, Chris. Um, the middle school program uh, in the arts, first of all, the arts programs in Harrison are among the finest and uh, they keep me happy. I probably, I have seen almost every single show in my 20 years in Harrison, every single concert. Um, it's, it's been incredibly uplifting and it's heartbreaking to see kids have to in any way be limited because the level of participation, the number of kids who find themselves, find their voices, find a way to really develop their self-confidence. Um, this program is so critically important to us. I'm gonna let Scott take you through how we've managed to keep it going. And we're so optimistic that the future will be brighter because we, we can't wait to give it back to kids in its fullest form. But Scott, would you just talk us through how this is gonna play out? Sure. Um, so there are um, two classes that students, let's start with art first, I'm sorry, that students take every year for 10 weeks. One is art and one is digital design. Um, 
the art classes, the fine arts, um, drawing, um, sculptures, things of that nature. And digital design is a computer-based course where students learn everything from uh, Photoshop to making movies. There are 10 weeks each quarter, and we thought it was really important to have them, of course, in the school day. Uh, students will have their own art supplies that they'll be you know, safely kept themselves in their backpack. We'll be providing that to them. Um, digital design, of course, is, is a computer-based course, so that works uh, well that way. Um, the music classes do vary. So we have chorus, band, orchestra, uh, percussion in one grade, and we have general music as well. And the courses, it depends on which course. So for example, an orchestra class where they're you know, playing violins and cellos, they can be six foot distanced with a mask and they may play. The percussion, same thing. Um, chorus can be 12 feet apart. We're gonna use our auditorium, which gives us the space, if not outside at various times, and be 12 feet apart with a mask and singing. And while it may not be the most optimal, it affords students the opportunity to sing. And Mr. Test has already been planning accordingly for making that a, a great experience. Um, and our band class is gonna become a little different in its instructional class that meets on an alternating basis in school, where Mr. Sachs will plan lessons that accentuate the different types of bands and history and things of that nature. And, and a general music sort of feel, but with an emphasis on bands, learning instrumentation, things that you can do, um, but you can't play the actual instruments. However, orchestra and band, I referenced in the earlier with the orchestra lesson, will take place for students who have this course in a virtual setting. So it gives students who are in the band and orchestra that opportunity that when they're home, they're gonna get some direct instruction there once in a six day cycle. Um, and that will be scheduled according. There'll be certain periods that are available that students will know from their teacher, they're in this rotation group, and they'll know that every six days at home, they're going to get online, um, teacher will be there, and they'll be instructed accordingly. Yeah, and that's about the best we can do in this environment. We are waiting on new research because we would very much like to bring band back into school, but unfortunately at this point, we don't feel comfortable doing it. Thank you, Scott. So I want to spend some time talking about um, hybrid and virtual options. And Michael, if you want to join me in this discussion, please feel free. So in hybrid, you're going to have in-person, smaller group instruction on alternating days. The kids will be socially distanced, but there'll be a great deal of in-person teacher-student interaction. There'll be virtual asynchronous instruction on the alternating days, which is essentially what the hybrid model means. For those of you experiencing the virtual option, you will be having remote video instruction on alternating days. So the days that the hybrid kids are in class, those students will be Zooming in or Google Classrooming in to uh, that environment. I'm gonna give you the particulars of what that's gonna look like and interactivity as we go on. Teacher-student synchronous interaction is more limited. So we don't wanna oversell, we're not trying to discourage you, but there is nothing that takes the place of in-person teaching. As brilliant as our teachers are, as well-trained as they are, living in both the synchronous world, I'm sorry, the virtual world and the in-person world is a challenge because you're not just managing two environments. If you have five or six kids online, each one of those children is in a unique space. And we learned that through our experimentation this summer. On the days that the students that are in the hybrid model are getting their asynchronous work, the kids assigned to that cohort, that class, will be re receiving the same level of instruction. Now, in a few slides, so I know you the questions are gonna start to pop up, we're gonna give you some examples of how the technology, up. Oh, there it is. So Mr. Seligman is our director of technology. He's gonna come on in a second. What I asked him to do, you met our teachers and we talked about how Chelsea probably planned for 50 hours to get that unit to where it is. Uh, we want to make sure that the management part for teachers is doable and sustainable. We want to make sure that the privacy of kids in the classroom is maintained. But to the extent possible, we want to make sure that the kids that choose the virtual option have a very positive experience and can interact with the teacher, can hear the teacher, can ask questions of the teacher, can see the teacher. So. I'm gonna ask Brian to explain where we are. And I will also add that as far as we've come, 
we will be putting together a cohort of our expert teachers to let them field test and determine whether there are things that have to change in the model of virtual learning that we're proposing. So Mr. Seligman, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roll. Uh, so yeah, so at the middle school, all of our instructional spaces have uh, teacher computers and smart boards. And so when teachers are teacher teaching in person, uh, obviously they use the technology that they've always used and all the software and, and hardware that they're used to and accustomed to. Um, the only change this year will be that we'll put a web camera in the classroom uh, aimed at the teacher and the teacher's instructional uh, materials, a smart board or a whiteboard. And this will allow the students who are home on the virtual only or remote only option, um, the ability to see and hear the teacher uh, delivering that instruction. In addition to the web camera, the teachers will create their Zoom or Google Meet and will be able to virtually share out exactly what's on the smart board. So the kids aren't looking at the smart board through the video camera, they're gonna look through it uh, directly, just like you're seeing the screen that Dr. Wool is sharing. Um, the kids at home will see the teacher screen um, as the teacher is using the smart board and using uh, the instructional tools that they have. And, and that is it in a nutshell, but I will say to you that we're gonna to continue to test. Brian is looking at new options and you know we have trained this in incredible cohort of expert teachers now and we'd like to get them in before school opens to, to have them test this model to see if there's something more that we can provide to teachers to make it work. We are convinced, we've tried it out our, ourselves, that kids can hear, they can see, but it, we also wanna make it as management friendly for teachers as we can, because as you can imagine, there's a lot they're already managing. There are some prerequisites. This should help to answer some of the questions. So first of all, you can't jump back and forth uh, readily, like on a daily basis or weekly basis. Students have to remain in the virtual option for a full marking period. Placement changes will occur at the beginning of a marking period because we want you to actually get the full experience and see what it's like. And we also want to diminish the number of changes that occur for the teachers. Students who participate virtually are expected to have their cameras on and be visible to the teacher. A couple of reasons why that is. It's easier to determine whether or not people are engaged by looking at them and to see if they're present. And we are also concerned that we protect the privacy of kids. And so we have found apps, just like I have a virtual background behind me, students will have the option of uh, masking their, their room or their wherever they are. Because if you weren't looking at LMK, what you'd see is my messy desk and a pile of books. We wanna give kids this, the ability to remain private, but we will require and for safety purposes, we wanna know that the student is actually there, the teacher can make eye contact. And as I said to you already, on the days that they're not zooming in to join the lecture, they will be learning asynchronously. Now, one of the questions said, why can't they zoom in every day? Because remember, the teachers are teaching two different classes. They're not free on the other days. So the student will experience the lesson that the teacher has taught, the next group of kids will come in the following day and the teacher will be reteaching that lesson to the other 12. So quite demanding on teachers because they're always juggling at a minimum two or three things at a time. Lou, the so, only thing I would, I would add to that is to emphasize yeah. from an instructional perspective, our teachers have been designing curriculum in, in a very precise way, as you saw examples. And that, that precision, that design was premised on a hybrid model. So when we emphasize that the hybrid model is what we planned for, we've designed precisely against that model. This is, an, this is a change. And uh, as teachers have planned for the live instruction, they've planned for 50% of, of the class size, and they've planned obviously very carefully for what asynchronous learning looks like. So it's meaningful, so it's supporting, so it's enriching, and um, uh, so that it's structured in a self-directed way. Um, the remote option for virtual learning is not um, a substitute. And so, you know, uh, there are some limitations. Somebody asked, well, what will happen when, um, will a teacher remain in the field of view um, all the time? The answer is no. Um, per teachers will adjust their instruction to try to uh, support the additional uh, students who are zooming in. But uh, in that case, uh, it's not a reasonable expectation that a teacher will only remain in the field of view of the camera all the time. 
Will a student be able to ask questions through a chat feature, but not uh, through a, um, uh, a voice? It would be very much like um, right now, we have public comment uh, through a chat. It's a more interactive chat, but it, it is a chat. So we say that as a caveat. We don't say it as um, a way to dissuade, but we uh, have designed instruction around the uh, hybrid model with live and asynchronous learning. And I think it's also worth pointing out one of the things that um, that the Board of Education, um, as well as the administration felt was very important based on um, everything that was experienced in the spring was that it was important that, as we said earlier, when, because we all think it is quite likely that we will go to a fully virtual model at some point, um, uh, because if experience in other communities um, follows here, it is likely that um, community spread will increase and we will at some point have to close down schools for health and safety reasons. We wanted um, the transition, it was very important that the transition to a fully virtual model be seamless. And the most um, effective way to make sure for both students, teachers, and families that it was seamless was that the model in terms of days in school, days out of school, days learning from home were, remained the same, whether students were in school or out of school. Um, so that's another, uh, I think, another piece of the reason that um, students won't be zooming in on days when they are learning from home, whether they're in the in-school model or the fully virtual model. That's right. And the, uh, thank you for underscoring that, Kelly. The only thing I want to remind people to, and this was a conscious decision on our part, so we mentioned all the field testing our teachers did. When these numbers tick up, if we were to go fully virtual, much above 15, it is not very effective for a teacher to be able to check in and manage those things. The amount of planning that goes into, if you've ever, and many of you have watching, have used Zoom, you need to pre-plan your groups. Well, in classrooms, groups evolve over the course of the period. So uh, we tried to, in the likelihood that we go fully virtual, the kids who are virtual and the kid will be merged. There'll be one class of uh, a 12, give or take. And that will stay constant throughout the duration until we get back to normal schooling because we want to ensure that our teachers can do the quality work that they want to provide for your children. Um, it won't just be sitting in front of a computer uh, all day long, um, not fully engaged. So that, that was a conscious choice. So the seamless transition, but also the maintenance of smaller class sizes. Now there is some exception to that rule. Let me show you what it is. Um, our certain populations will be coming to school four or five days a week because they have needs that exceed what other children require. So our students with disabilities in special classes, self-contained classes, K-12. Julie, I, I feel confident talking about this, but I think it's just an appropriate time to introduce you. Maybe you could talk about these populations and then uh, Scott, you'll address the English language learners, okay? Sure. Yeah. Good evening, Julie. I, I know you're still bubbling over uh, about Chris uh, Galano. Yeah, and Chris I Galano. certainly am. I was going to talk about um, a DBT skill is, is especially or during these trying times is gratitude. And I, I certainly am very grateful for the partnership with Chris Galano, the PE teachers, the psychologists. It's, a, it's really a positive thing during a very difficult period. But we'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, so yes, there's been guidance, and I think it's the right guidance um, that we really should do uh, do what we can to serve our students who are most vulnerable every day. Um, and we are able to do that for kids in self-contained special class programs. Uh, we've had an in-person program this summer, and we we did it, and it was it was really incredible uh, for the students for the for the adults um, and certainly for the families. And also along those same lines, um, our English language learners, I could just talk about this, um, who are entering and emerging are also because of their unique learning um, needs and language acquisition, we are able to accommodate them in person every day. And I certainly will talk about um, 
special education and, and students with disabilities in a, in a little bit. But if Scott, did you want to talk yes. a little? Thank you, Julie. That was great. And I have gratitude for all the great training you have provided to us well before COVID-19 was an issue. Getting all these psychologists trained in this trauma-based education was such a smart thing that you did ahead of time. Thank you. Scott? Yeah, well, well I think Julie just mentioned it. So students who are, um, we have a very large English language and a, and a very successful English language uh, program for uh, in ENL. Um, wonderful teachers do incredible work um, helping students who come here. Our entering and emerging students, which for those of you out there, those are our students who are really brand new. Um, they come to our building really not speaking much English at all, and you'd be amazed that within a year they speak English. Um, but we recognize the needs of students. Um, when they come to the building, they need to be there every day. Um, they're not necessarily going to be um, separated from a cohort of Husky or Pride, they will be. But we've arranged a way that our uh, gifted ENL teachers will be able to work with them on the day that they might have been at home. We think it's really important that even if they're doing asynchronous work, that they're on site with that direct support. Um, as you can imagine, they really need so that they have questions, they have the support. Remember, they're, they're from homes where very often their parents and them may speak a different language. And here's the golden opportunity to be in the building with direct instruction and support. So they'll be here on a daily basis. Those that are at the highest levels, commanding, expanding, who really already speak the language, they'll come every other day like a typical cohort of Husky or Pride. Thank you. And I, I should also say that our, our director of uh, English, ELL, English Language Learners, and ENL stands for English as a New Language, is also our director of uh, foreign languages. And she is taking a much deserved vacation after running the summer programs here in district. And it was her recommendation that language immersion for these students was critically important. So keeping them on site for those extra days is hopefully going to help them more quickly master the very convoluted language as a former English teacher that is the English language. Has the toughest rules in the world. So here's a little bit more about the, what, what are termed the L's, the English language learners. Um, we're not going to talk about the K-5 students tonight. We'll go into that in depth tomorrow. And Scott has already thoroughly explained the different levels that kids uh, enter. So there's emerging, expanding, transitioning, and it's all based on an assessment that we do on their language facility. And as he also said, one of our proudest points of pride is that these students do very well, not only on assessments, but they quickly emerge from these uh, programs and are self-sustaining in the language. Julie, this is where I'm gonna turn it back to you because there is so much to share and talk about. Yeah, so um, just again to reiterate, uh, students who are in self-contained special classes or 1211s or 812s, what we call phase, um, or three or more SGI classes, um, we can accommodate you in person every day. Um, for our students in general ed classes, like integrated co-teaching classes, or if you just have an academic skills class, consultant teacher services, or just related services, we, um, you will be part of the general ed programming, which is on the every other day schedule. Um, I, I will say I have received a, several phone calls, questions, and understandable concerns uh, for students with IEPs who are not going to be coming to school every day. I hear you. We're, we're working. My, my best um, guidance is to let's keep the lines of communication open. We'll talk it out. We will, of course, correct if we need to, if we need to have a CSE meeting to revisit services and level of service, uh, we will do so. Um, so let's just keep talking to each other and, 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 and figure this out. Um, all related services and resource room or skill academic skills classes will be synchronous, whether they are in person or remote, meaning it will be a live experience. So your special education services are a live experience, whether they're in person or via Zoom or Google Meet. 
DSC Committee on Special Education meetings will continue at this time to be via Google Meet or Zoom and our CSE evaluations. We've done many, many this summer. I was very excited to, to do that um, in person. Uh, so we will, we will continue to do all CSE evaluations according to the regulations. And, and I will say that, you know, one of the points of pride of this organization is the level of care that goes into constructing each one of these programs. So if you're a parent tonight and you're listening, as Julie said, and you're not sure, you can reach out to Mr. Freed, you can reach out to, uh, well, you can't reach out to Mrs. Sameo. She had a baby today, we, we think. Well, almost. Not okay. yet. <laughs> Soon. She's having a baby. But uh, we, we wish her well. She, but we will find uh, there are lots of folks in the building. Just let Julie know. Let Scott know. If you have a question, we want you to know that you're going to be heard and that we'll do everything we can to adjust and make sure that every service that you need for your child is delivered in a way that makes sense for your child. Okay. There we go. So um, I think Kelly is going to handle this. Kelly Malczewski is our Director of Guidance. Um, she plays a major role in 6 to 12 school counseling and other things as well. But uh, Kelly, do you want to jump in here? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Wool. Um, I'm excited to present uh, a little bit about the school counseling program at LMK tonight. Um, my office is physically located at the high school, so oftentimes parents will get to know me a lot better at the um, grades 9 through 12, but certainly the school counselors are doing excellent work at the middle school, and I'm happy to highlight it today. Um, throughout the conversation tonight, even you've heard um, school counselors mentioned in relation to school psychologists and building the schedule and balancing sections. So school counselors just play such a critical role in all of the work that is happening currently behind the scenes. Um, and certainly in these three key areas that I listed here, the social, emotional, health and wellness, academics and academic advisement, as well as transition, which we talked a lot about in terms of fifth to sixth grade and of course, eighth to ninth as well. Um, really, you know, classroom teachers are the first line of defense when it comes to the social emotional support, academic support, but also the school counselors are always there to partner with the teachers, partner with families, um, to help provide your child a transition back to school and really make sure they're getting um, on track. And if they're not really helping them, um, helping you and your family provide a support for them and working with teachers and any other stakeholders as appropriate. Um, just like all of the content area directors mentioned um, in terms of essentializing curriculum and modifying curriculum, guidance is doing the same thing. So um, it's not as um, obvious sometimes that a guidance curriculum exists, but it does. So school counselors have been working um, tirelessly to make sure they're adjusting their programming, their events, their planning um, to really meet the needs of each of their caseloads and really be able to provide individualized programs and supports for students. Um, the beauty of the school counseling department also is that, um, you know, you, students will have options. If, you know, a student is in need during the school day, they can always pop into the school counselor's office and have those conversations. Or if it makes more sense to set up those meetings, particularly as a family on an asynchronous school day, uh, school counselors will be available in that way as well. Um, and all of this work is really thoughtful and purposeful. And I, the last bullet there talks about progress monitoring systems. School counselors play a critical role in monitoring students' performance, um, meeting with teachers in a team meeting setting, and the RTI process as well, partnering with school psychologists as the level of need may increase. So really school counselors are there to support your children in whatever um, avenue they may need support in and really just be proactive about um, identifying any needs that may surface as we move into this this um, new school year. Um, I also just want to mention myself as a resource. Um, middle school parents don't always think to reach out to me necessarily because I'm located at the high school, but any of their um, social emotional needs, school counseling needs, I'm also a direct contact that can be helpful to you as well. Thank you, Kelly. And I, I think you, you pointed out one of the key things is there is a difference in middle level counseling. They basically act as the guide for kids and teachers there. They're incredible conduits. As I mentioned earlier, what we love about this model is they get to know these students so well because they maintain that counseling relationship for three years. Uh, and so by the time they leave, literally every student is known very well by the counselor. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. And now we get more into the mental health acts aspect. I've been sharing all night how excited I am about the good work that's been done. But Julie, this is your chance to sort of put some meat on the bone. 
Yeah, so I think um, you can hear me, right? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, there's, there's really good coherent um, connections and collaboration between the guidance department, the leadership team, um, the psychologist, and we will have, we've increased psychological support uh, for this year. So we will have three full-time psychologists and um, many of them came to us with real expertise in, in, in mental health and treatment modalities. And they've also received a lot of training, um, you know, while being in Harrison. So this summer, they really did understand the importance of trauma-informed uh, teaching practices. And, and trauma sounds like a very heavy, heavy word, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, something so incredibly traumatic. It is a spectrum, but we've had collective as a community, as a nation, as a world. We, we, this has been difficult emotionally, socially, physically. And so um, we think it's really important to equip our teachers with approaching their work through what we call a trauma-informed lens. And we also want to provide that trauma-informed approach to our faculty who understandably have their own concerns, their own personal concerns, that this is just a, a difficult time. Um, so one of the biggest things I think is to teach our kids and ourselves ways to manage our strong emotions. And that is it, dialectical behavior therapy, which has been mentioned, is, is really a skills-based curriculum where we are explicitly teaching our students mindfulness skills, um, just being present, and it, how to um, regulate one's emotions, how to tolerate distress, and, and how to have really effective relationships. We know that if we have good connections with our students, and they have good connections with each other, and we have good, good relationships with um, our, our peers and our colleagues, but that is a, a protective factor. So we're really, you know, we, we have been focusing on this for quite some time, as we should. Um, I think it's ever more present right now, and, and people are really responding. Our psychologists, who are resident experts, have trained over 90 staff members, and it's been well received, and the, con and the training continues. So it'll be part of our superintendent conference days, it'll be part of our new teacher orientation. Um, so I really think, you know, we're, we're on it. Um, and our hope is to really care for each other, care for you as parents, care for our kids and care for each other. And, and I, I'm, I'm so excited that that's going to be a part of the opening day training for our entire faculty to help them reacquaint themselves, but also to deepen their understanding about these techniques, because, you know, so much has happened for kids. And Julie has basically helped the teachers become better sentinels of uh, the emotional well-being of students. So I, I really appreciate all that work. And, and Scott is a great partner, as you mentioned, and that, that team is just, I can't really say enough about them. They're extraordinary people. Um, we are wending towards the way. Here's a question many of you have been asking all night, so now you're going to get uh, a solid answer. And we, we, we believe that this is linked to social and emotional well-being, and I am so always so pleased at the kind of support we get from our board. What we learned last year is that our clubs, believe it or not, thrived despite the fact that we went virtual. Uh, it they were very meaningful connections for kids. The advisors did great work. And uh, Chris Galana will tell you that even now, although athletics is canceled, and he'll talk more about that in a minute, the coaches have maintained deep connections to their teams and tried to build culture. Because for us, the purpose of these activities is not just the activity or the athletics. It's to give kids connection, the opportunity to discover themselves, to feel a part of a community, even within a community. So, um, Scott, you want to talk about some of the the clubs that we we experience and that we hope will continue? The the after school tutoring, the all of that stuff is just so vital to the the lifeblood of our school. Sure. Um, first of all, a thank you to you and to the board for the continued support here of the extracurricular activity program. 
um, any opportunity that we have to make school a longer day for more experience with students. And frankly, whether it's virtual or in person, if we can continue to have social interaction, it's really of the utmost importance right now. Uh, the middle school has a variety of extracurricular activities. And it ranges from those that are academic. You saw um, Alana Brown before, she's run um, debate, um, which is links to the you know, highly successful high school program. We have programs in the arts, we have an international club, we have an environmental club, um, we have music clubs such as jazz band that can go on and on and on. Historically, um, clubs have come out of student interest as well. I've had many students come to me want to start a club and that could still happen. They find an advisor, they make a pitch. Um, and that's probably, you know, a good third of our clubs. We keep our library available open after school, which students use and we'll continue. Obviously we'll have to limit the number of students that can be there and follow, you know, social distancing guidelines. Um, we also have a program uh, where students tutor each other. We're looking at that to be more virtual um, because we understand that that's going to be a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. But that's one where um, we're really um, partner with the high school students and they are actually become peer tutors. Sometimes our eighth graders are peer tutors to some of our sixth graders, but the high school in coordination with the middle school, our guidance staff um, runs that. Actually, Mr. DeMundo and one of our teachers, Ms. O'Reilly ran, a special ed teacher ran it last year, highly successful. So any time that we can continue to have these clubs run, um, and as, as you said, it's not just about the content, it's really about the interaction that students have. And whether there are two students in the building on a day and three popping up virtually, we'll continue them to the best of our abilities. Thank you. And Chris, people have been waiting all night to hear about extracurriculars, but as well, they've been waiting to hear about interscholastic athletics. And uh, I think you should talk tonight a little bit about the modified program and what is happening there. Uh, yeah, so again, to echo the message that are, has already been said, but uh, we appreciate and, uh, you know, going to the section meetings, which is all of Westchester and Putnam Valley and um, Rockland County, a lot of schools are holding off or don't see the value in, in the athletics, um, you know, during the virtual time, but we saw it as a huge benefit to the kids. Um, I just had a senior uh, a student who was leaving to go to college that thanked me for um, providing a virtual athletic um, opportunity and she specifically spoke to um, an incident with her, with her coach. So we, I mean, we believe in it, the coaches believe in it, but I appreciate the district and, and Lou and, um, you know, to support that. Um, as of right now, the uh, governor is the one that's going to make the call on when we'll be able to um, start off season training. It's not so much at the middle school level, but it still could be. Um, right now, the start date for all fall sports is September 21st. That was moved from um, August 24th. That start date is um, up in the air due to a variety of reasons. Um, you might have heard in the news that different states are doing different things. And, um, you know, it puts us at a difficult position, but um, it is not the school district. It's not Dr. Wool. It's not the Board of Education. We will get a mandate of what we can do. And there will be a phased um, process that we will follow uh, when sports are allowed back. You will be getting all of this information as it breaks. Um, there's a new tab on our athletics website that is specific to coronavirus. Um, so, you know, when uh, registration will begin, when uh, sports will begin, if they are postponed, which is a uh, likely possibility, they could be three seasons in the spring um, and some of you are like, how would that work? I, when I read it the first time, I was a little confused as well, but um, they would start with a winter season in January. Then they would do um, a fall and, uh, and uh, spring season. Um, obviously, the se season would be shortened, and we are following uh, strict guidelines on uh, what we would need to do as far as um, you know, sharing of equipment, how many uh, – Kids can be together and, you know, and a wide range of uh, other things. But the bottom bullet, I think, is what is most important. We are, we want the kids to be out and, and competing and, and playing and enjoying each, uh, each other. But if we are um, in a situation where we are not in uh, live learning, we will, the coaches are expected and, and did it in the spring and other schools have actually reached out to me 
um, looking for a model on how to uh, use the athletic program as a social emotional um, you know, anchor to, to help kids. Uh, because what we saw in the spring was that many, many kids felt that was their uh, way of, uh, you know, getting to the school and, and having their uh, voice heard. So um, again, like Scott said, you know, with the clubs, it's the same with athletics. It's not, um, you know, obviously we want to be out playing, but there's, uh, you know, bigger, uh, a bigger situation going on. So our, our coaches are um, eager to, um, interact with your kids if it's live or if it's virtual. Um, but I do, I have been getting emails about when will it start and when will registration start. That's all on the website and I will send out information as soon as I get it. Um, and, you know, we'll push the information out. Thank you, Chris. And, you know, you know we, we, we talked about the athletics, we talked about clubs, the arts are also a vital element to this program. And we will be dealing with uh, maintaining the arts programs to the extent we can as well, because, you know, our whole mission is our school is predicated on the theory of multiple intelligences. We think that students all learn differently. They're all incredibly gifted and unique in their own special ways. And the more that we can keep these conduits to these various activities relevant and available, I think the better it's going to be for kids in this very challenging time. Um, I'm gonna ask Brian Seligman to come back in. We're coming to the close of our presentation, so, but stick around, there's still important information to come. We, as you know, we don't let any student go without technology if it's needed. The district will provide it for families as well as internet access. But Brian, do you just wanna to speak to the BYOD at the middle school? Sure, um, I think we're entering our sixth or seventh year of BYOD at the middle school, uh, bring your own device. So we've asked um, families of kids in grades six or 12 to purchase a device, um, could be a, an iPad, a Chromebook, a laptop, tablet, um, and have that, their child bring the device to school. Um, if there's any issue with the device, um, it breaks or, or you need a, a replacement, we can provide that. Um, so all you need to do is just talk to one of the assistant principals or the principal of the school, Mr. Freed, and uh, we'll provide that. If you don't have a device and need help with that, we'll, we'll provide a device for anyone. Uh, and that includes a hotspot if you don't have internet. Um, so we'll be able to help with that. Um, what I would recommend is that you and your child work out a, um, a, an agreement on how the device will get charged so that when the child does come to school, it comes charged and uh, they'll be able to use it in the school uh, without issues. Um, if for any reason a student comes to school with a device that's not charged or not working or they forget it for some reason, we will be able to provide them with a device. Uh, we'll have a protocol for that. Um, students will not be allowed to share devices, so we'll have fewer that we'll be allowed to provide to students, um, but we still will be able to provide a, a few of them um, in this situation. And um, um, if there's any questions about the use of technology at the middle school, we have um, some clubs that actually the students will help other students on how to use the technology. Our teachers are informed also on how to use the technology and we have support within the building. Uh, but we also have a help desk. So if there are questions about the use of the technology, whether it's software or the hardware, um, feel free to use the help desk, which is uh, located on the um, uh, school web, on the district website uh, under links for parents. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I, Scott, am I wrong? What did the kids name themselves? Is that the genius bar? That is the genius bar. Yeah, exactly. I, I like their hubris. <laughs> oh, you just go to them, they, you know, like you mean, it's not just students. I know. So transportation is a challenge and we will be issuing, issuing a new survey to parents about a whole host of things on Friday now that we have the virtual option. But uh, obviously it's very helpful to us if you drop off your kids. If you commit to that, you don't have to live and die by it. If your circumstances change, you let us know and we'll provide you the transportation that you are eligible for. We will be reducing the number of students who ride the bus by actually more than half, but 21 students, one student per seat wearing a mask. Uh, the only exception to that rule is siblings. They can sit together. Uh, you're required to wear a mask on the bus the monitors and bus driver will also be wearing a mask. The only exception to that is if the bus driver wears glasses, the 
DOT permits him to remove his mask while he's driving so his glasses aren't foggy. Um, and if a student doesn't have a mask, one will be provided to him uh, by the bus company. Uh, the school buses will not be fully disinfected between bus runs, but the bus drivers have been trained and will clean the high touch areas between the morning and the afternoon. And then each night, the buses will be fully disinfected. Whenever weather permits, the windows will be open and um, between routes, they'll be open to air the buses out. Each day, the drivers and monitors will complete their own COVID-19 symptom screening, the same thing that you're being asked to do with your own kids. Gloves will be offered to the monitors and the drivers and worn when direct contact with student is required. And the rule that is sometimes a little lax, there will be absolutely no drinking or eating on the school buses. Food service is another um, daunting task for us. So if you're a free or reduced lunch family, you are, uh, let us know. We probably already know, but we'll be asking you in the survey if you'd like to have meals on the days that you're not in school, and those will be prepared and made available for you to get on the days you're not in school. However, if you want to purchase lunch on the days that you're not in school, you are also permitted to do that. So if you don't want your, to make lunch for your family, you can request and let us know and we'll ask you that. And you can pre-order your lunch for the days that your family's not in school and you will also be given the opportunity to pick that up. Um, we will remind kids constantly about the importance of hand washing. There'll be hand sanitizers everywhere. Somebody asked earlier in the night, how often can kids wash their hands? Well, in the classroom, they'll be able to sanitize them whenever they think it's appropriate and obviously between classes, they can use the lavatory, or if they have a question or concern about washing their hands, they can ask a teacher. Um, cafeteria furniture has already been rearranged to limit the number of students, and Scott has talked about that. Students will be um, permitted to take off their masks when they eat. Uh, they will be cohorted, but after they've completed their meal, they are gonna be asked to return their mask. Um, we, we think that there's, a tremendous benefit to kids having this social experience uh, on a regular basis. And um, we hope that they'll be mindful of how to assist in keeping it, the, 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 uh, the risk to a, a minimum. Food service workers have already been trained in safe food handling and preparation to avoid the spread of COVID-19. Mr. Salerno has been working uh, tirelessly throughout the summer. There's been multiple trainings uh, the way lunches will be served will be different. They'll be essentially sealed, so there'll be no physical exchange. A child will pick up their lunch, open it. All of the utensils will be in sealed uh, plastic. They, unfortunately, it creates a lot of waste, but it is, at this point in time, the lesser of two evils. So um, the custodial staff is going to sanitize between uh, each lunch period, as they always do. And remember, there'll be far fewer children in the cafeteria. And Scott wanted to mention that our cafeteria is also air conditioned and brings in fresh air and has a great air exchange and all the windows are operational. So uh, did I leave anything out about that, Scott, that you wanted to say? Uh, the only thing I'd mention also, and I forgot to mention earlier, we're also gonna look for as many opportunities to be outside as well. Uh, small groups of students to get fresh air. I know that's also something we wanna do, so. Right, and we, we will have these, this building is slated to be completed before the kids come back and there will be a lovely outdoor seating area, we hope so. So can we, can you just clarify, I think there was a little confusion. Um, if families want meals on the days they are not in school, they will not be coming to school on an off day or will food be delivered? They would be given those meals on the day their child is in school. So the food would be provided to them the day before to eat the following day. Correct. Perhaps we're we're looking at a model that's being used in other districts. We're not fully determined. Okay. It may seem easier, as we did in the summer, to distribute meals to uh, throughout the community and have people pick them up, as opposed to having kids travel with, you know, two bags of food on on the on the on the school bus. So, actually, Kelly, to be determined, we will. Thank you. When Mr. Yeah, Salerno returns. Gonna... 
Yeah, if I could just add to that, we're actually um, we're meeting with our food services company again next week. We've met with them several times already, um, and we had a meeting last week with all the principals just to try to brainstorm about the best way to get the meals home to the kids. Um, this was before the virtual option was implemented too, so we do have to think about that population that um, may be home every day. So, as Dr. Wool said, to be continued or determined. Um, Thank you. Very, very good point, Margaret. And I think that that is what we do best. Rather than tell you in advance, we exhaust every option and try to figure out what's going to work best. Uh, right now, you know, we actually have had some lunches prepared and carried them around. So we'll see how that goes. We'll, we'll let you know. Uh, some other questions that have popped up in the chat, I think are worth just my spending a second to review. Um, it won't be delivered. We are not certain that we're going to let parents volunteer, but we appreciate the offer. The question came up about medically vulnerable students. So that is now no longer an issue. It was an issue because it was the only uh, exception that we were going to provide. If you feel your child is medically vulnerable, they have the option of full virtual learning at this point. And the question of homework is a fair one. Um, Lou, could I just yeah, could go I ahead, just please. one other thing? Um, if there is a, a, a medical concern and you want to send your child in person, I would ask that you, um, we, we can look at that and we, would co we will collaborate with this, mm -hmm. our school physician and your school physician so you can contact um, my office. You beat me to the punch. In the new survey, if you want, you have a medically um, fragile child or someone with an underlying condition, but you'd like to get additional PPE, you will have again, many of you have already requested, but we're gonna ask the question again to make sure now that things have changed or you wanna ask a different question, you can certainly always, if it's safe and we can accommodate you and you want your child to come back, we're gonna provide those options. Julie's forgot, I think she did mention, we ran a successful in-person summer program. You wanna share what that was like, Jules? Yeah, so some of our students um, this summer did try to wear masks. Um, it was quite um, adorable on the first day they all came in with masks. Um, but then over time, it was a, a difficult for them to maintain that. Uh, so what we did was we um, added increased PPE to the adults, including gowns, face shields, um, and, and masks. So similarly, if there is a medical issue um, and you would like your child to come to school, we will work hard to figure it out. I'm also ordering um, see-through clear masks for our speech and language pathologists and teachers who work with students with hearing impairments um, or students who um, have articulation issues. So. We're trialing those. There's been some negatives around those masks, but we, I have a big order in and we're gonna um, see how that goes to see if we wanna expand that order. Right, we, we've done some experimentation, but we're not sure yet. There seems to be some challenges with fogging as well. The question about homework, just to go back to it for a second. Homework has not only been modified, all of the curriculum has been modified the asynchronous work is really an extension of extended learning. So homework is almost a different kind of experience completely than it was last year, we, we believe. Just want to do two things before I end this presentation and show you one more resource that you can access on your own. So this document is likely to change again it's actually changed multiple times as more options become available, as we find new things that might work more effectively for parents, or as the guidance changes, we will keep you in the loop. Um, it's um, regularly updated, and we now have a dedicated reopening webpage, which I'm going to show you in a second. I'll continue to update the PT Council, which includes representatives from all six schools. You will receive regular communications from your principal and from me as you did last year, probably not as regularly as you did last year because now we have a more systematized plan. And as I mentioned to you, I know the, the, the question of surveys has come up. 
Um, I feel now that we're ready to ask you meaningful questions about what we know we can do, we will be doing that. And they'll occur at the two week, the four week and the 10 week period. And uh, they will be comprehensive. So having said that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. If uh, I can figure out how to do that. There we go. Do you still see my screen, folks? Yes. Okay, I can't find my stop share button. Yes. Where did it... There it is. No, that's not it. I, I moved my control so much I can't stop sharing my screen. Somebody help me. Lou, on the uh, top of your screen, you should have a... Oh, there we go. It's back. Are we out now? Yeah. We okay. are. Sorry about that. Do you want me to share the uh, website for you? In, in one minute before you do. So before we close tonight, uh, there are a number of people here who have been sitting all night uh, listening because we were concerned that questions might emerge about the high school. Uh, Ms. Bukema, thank you for sitting again, uh, through another full night. Um, and you did a magnificent job last night. There are the video of the presentation we did the night prior is now available to you. This video will be available tomorrow. And uh, we have one more to go. Uh, tomorrow night, the, high uh, the elementary school will be explored fully. Please remember, up to 500 people can sit into the, the uh, webinar experience, but unlimited folks can watch from a live stream at home. Um, Lou, may I, um, may I address two, just two quick things that popped up and the question might put sure. some at ease. Um, there were several things I saw in the, in the Q&A about like with regard to the fact that we're not using lockers. Um, I sent out recently, if parents didn't see it, we've uh, streamlined our supplies. Um, we recognize that. So we, we understand that students are going to be carrying backpacks. So it's much more limited. Um, therefore, we, we expect students shouldn't have much more than maybe a notebook or so and their device and should be much easier. And the other is just for, I saw a question out there about if a child is ill, um, can they stream in? And I just wanted to share as a principal, I think I'd speak for all of us. If you're sick, we want you to rest. Um, we want you to stay in bed, drink fluids. Um, I just wanted to get that out there. I don't want students to feel if they're sick, they should be struggling to get online just because right. I admire them for wanting to do that work. And just to be consistent, the answer that I provided last night is it's, it's going to be an individualized decision between the teacher, the student, and the parent, uh, because that is a lot to manage. It means the teacher has to then add that student to the Zoom. And as you point out, if a student is too sick to come to school, it's probably best for that child to rest, but we're not going to have a hard and fast. We're going to leave a lot of discretion in the hands of the professional educators that teach your kids every day. I just want to, before we show you our new website, and an easier way to navigate what you just experienced for the last three hours. I want to thank Alana again uh, for being so willing to, to stick your neck out here and share all of your very fine work. So proud of you. Chelsea, same to you. Thank you so much. Uh, to our directors uh, who are sort of the unsung heroes behind the scene, guiding teachers, supporting teachers, holding them up as they work through all this curriculum. Um, all of the uh, building-based administrators who've had to think about all the nuances to all of these elements. Uh, I, I've mentioned the special ed department innumerable times tonight, nuancing these things so that there's no one rule. We try to look at each child and make it fit and make it work. Our board of education continues to be just extraordinarily committed to making this uh, our mission alive. Uh, all means all in the Harrison Central School District. That's what this work is about. So before we close, I want to show you a simple way. If you didn't get your question answered or you don't want to sit through the video again, despite the fact that you can fast forward, let me share a resource. Michael, would you mind sharing the reopening? Thank you. It's so nice not to have to control this. Um, so here you see a brand new page. Let's just pretend for a minute you wanted to go back and revisit some questions about LMK. If you click on the LMK link on the left-hand side, if you wouldn't mind, Michael. So let's say that you wanted to revisit the, the concepts of masks and everything that we've talked about. If you click the link on masks, there's a page that breaks it down where mass breaks occur. So you don't need to uh, flounder around to read the whole plan. We've tried to make this hap uh, very simple for you. Uh, technology support, reopening in the orientation, 
the clubs and extracurriculars. There's also another critical button. Um, my colleague, Brian Ladwick, went through all the health and safety protocols. They're all enunciated painfully there for you to review, and they will be updated on a regular basis. In addition, there's one other place that will be helpful to you, and it's the FAQ. Um, we've collected a lot of information from these meetings and from other places. Uh, down on the bottom left, if you click on the FAQ, you will see uh, basically broken into broad categories each one of the things that you might have a question about. And we've tried to anticipate, uh, based on what we've heard and listened to, what is most uh, pressing for you at the moment. So if you have any further questions, I refer you to this website. You can close that out, Michael, and just bring us back. You lost your sh stop sharing screen too? Absolutely. Yeah. I know. There's, <laughs> some, there's something amiss with Zoom tonight. I apologize. Oh, the host helped me out. Thanks, uh, Mr. Seligman. So I just want to share um, my final thoughts. So there are lots of people who have opinions and ideas, and we respect your opinions and your ideas. But at the end of the day, there are two charges that we have to think about. Um, even when I consult, and I do with medical experts, there is no universal agreement on what the right thing to do is. And so um, my charge is to take care of the 3,600 kids that fall under my direct supervision. And uh, we view those children as sacred, as important to us as our own children are. And we will make every decision that we possibly can in their best interest. And when in doubt, we will shut it down. Um, in addition to that, I just want to say that we also need to remember that our teachers are overextended. What we're asking of them is astronomically difficult. Now we, I think, did a terrific job and they participated in training and researching and preparing, but there will be bumps in the road. It won't be from a lack of trying. It won't be from a lack of effort. These are uncharted territory. So I, I just want to remind everybody that we need to hold up our teachers in every way that we can. Um, they have demonstrated unequivocally the level of commitment they have to your kids. And so um, I'll put my head on my pillow tonight being very proud of the work that we have all done. And I do mean we, it's a huge collective, but this is an organization that is dedicated to making it safe and meaningful for your kids. So. Uh, Thank you for your time. We are closing out almost 10 o'clock on the dot. Thanks to every single person on this Zoom. Your contributions cannot be understated. Mr. Courtright, I didn't recognize you. I'm so sorry. Dennis sat in tonight in the event that elementary concerns emerged. I'm asking administrators to be present in all three meetings. It's a tremendous burden on their personal lives, but as just like teachers, they show up because they care. So have a great night. I hope you learned what you needed to learn and I, I thank you for uh, your kind indulgence. Thank you very much, everyone. Night all.